Day three of our coverage of the Goodwill Games tonight. You'll see American Jackie Joyner try to break the world record and win the gold in the concluding events of the Heptathlon. The unrivaled distance swimmer from the Soviet Union, Vladimir Salnikov, goes for his third gold of the Games in the men's 400 meters. And the U.S. women, fresh from a victory over Brazil, face Czechoslovakia. Led by Cheryl Miller, the women's basketball team will try to remain undefeated. And we'll show you the electrifying Antonio McKay in the men's 400 meter. All of that tonight and more as our coverage of the very first Goodwill Games continues. presents the 1986 Goodwill Games from Moscow and from Madrid. Good evening and welcome to day number three in coverage of the 1986 Goodwill Games. Well, the excitement of the opening ceremonies and the opening weekends is behind us. However, the excitement of the competition remains. As a matter of fact, it was about as exciting today as we could stand, as Marianne Laughlin is going to tell you right now. That's right, Bob. Today we had a lot of action at venues all over Moscow. The story of young U.S. swimmer Angel Myers just keeps getting better and better, we're proud to report. She won her fourth and fifth medals at the Games, both of them gold, as she swam the 100-meter freestyle and also anchored the women's 4x100 relay and makes her the most decorated medalist in the games thus far. We saw the U.S. women's volleyball team get upset by North Korea. Their medal hopes are now in jeopardy. In another round-robin volleyball contest, we saw Japan defeat Czechoslovakia. Out on the track, U.S. distance runner Doug Padilla won the 5,000 meter, followed by countryman Terry Brom. Bulgaria's Yevgeny Ignatov, Ignatov, we'll get it right, uh, also took the bronze there. And there was even more competition today in the Modern Pen and other events. We'll be updating you on the progress of the athletes as we continue with our coverage tonight on, as you said, day three, Bob. And we're going to continue following a story, a story that we've been bringing to you the last couple of days. It's the one about the Defense Department ban on participation in the Goodwill Games for three days, the team most devastated by the decision to forbid enlisted personnel from Welcome participating in the Games Good. has to be the U.S. boxers. No Master. less than nine U.S. boxers have been lost to the oh, Games as a result of the ban. Five-man backup team was hastily assembled and arrived in Moscow today, and our commentator, Paul Horning, met Coach Roosevelt Sanders and the team at the airport. You, Paul Horning. This is Coach Roosevelt Sanders of the... United States boxing team, which has arrived here at Sheremetyevo Airport. And coach, first of all, welcome to Moscow. I see you got your men behind you. It's been a long trip. Welcome to Moscow. Uh, Paul, we're welcome. Uh, very glad to be here in Moscow. Um, I think the young men are really prepared to box uh, starting on this Friday. Uh, we've trained hard in Colorado Springs. It's unfortunate that uh, several of us couldn't make that trip, but I'm sure that the guys that are here are going to be uh, more than worthy of the of the task of boxing uh, in a Goodwill game. What did that decision by Casper Weinberger do to the team? Well, uh, coincidence, uh, it's, it's a coincidence. We had just had a team meeting uh, as far as unity. Then we got the word that uh, some of our guys wouldn't be able to make the trip. We had another team meeting and we grew together even though those young men couldn't make this trip with us. I don't think it's going to affect us in any way. Uh, it's the only way it's going to affect us is we don't have the guys we had for two weeks with us, mm -hmm. but we'll be competitive, we'll be a uh, uh, representative of the United States and rep of ourselves and families, and we hope the, the fans here in the Soviet Union can appreciate what we're doing, and we're going to give them a good show. All right, so thank you very much, Thanks. Roosevelt, and good luck. Thank you, Paul. For the Goodwill Games, this is Paul Harning from Sheremetyevo Airport. Thank you, Paul Horning. Remember, boxing begins on the 11th of July. Paul Horning will be joining Don Chevrier and Skip Carey to cover the events. It'll be interesting to see how that team hastily assembled will be able to do. It was going to be a tough road for whatever boxing team 
came here to the Soviet Union because they have some fine boxers, also some from East Germany and some of the other countries. In a moment, we'll continue our coverage of the exciting swimming venues as our coverage goes on for the Goodwill Games. Take a look at our studio facilities, the TBS Sports Broadcasting Area here at Ostenkano Television Center on the north side of Moscow. Vladimir Salnikov, the swimming star of the Soviet Union, won the 800, won the 1500. Now he's trying to make it three in a row in the 400 meter. The United States has four swimmers entered in the event. Can any of them catch up to him? We don't know, but we'll find out in a moment as we go to the swimming venue and John Neighbor. Coming up, the men's 400-meter freestyle, the last appearance for Soviet Vladimir Salnikov. He's already broken one world record. We're going to see if he can do it again. The world record in this event held by Mikhail Gross, 347.80. We've got two empty lanes in this field of eight swimmers. Lane zero, top of the screen, Ahmad Hussein from Syria. Lane two, American Scott Brackett. He got a silver medal in the mile the other day. Stefan Liss from East Germany is in three. The big man, Vladimir Salnikov, 26-year-old captain of the Soviet team. He'll be in lane four. American Sean Killian in five, and American Jeff Pryor in six. Lane seven is empty. American John Witchell in eight, and Edward Petrov, the silver medalist in the 800 free, will be in lane nine. Eight lengths of the pool freestyle, and all eyes are on lane four. And the big man, the man with the big heart, Vladimir Salnikov. What else can we say about him? I mean, there are not enough words. Uh, he has not lost this race. He's lost this race once in eight years. He's the best. He knows he's the best. And the rest of the field knows he's the best, and I think that really helped his confidence going into his races. Well, this is the shortest event. He's known as a distance swimmer. This being the shortest distance event puts a lot of pressure on him, not only to be good in the long races, but to be fast as well. He's, he's going to get a good race here, I think. Uh, Scott Brackett, there, you know, we talked about him yesterday, the other day in the 1500. Uh, we talked about Vladimir in the 1500, but Scott Brackett went his best time by nine seconds in that race. Swam a brilliant race, second fastest time in the, uh, in the uh, world this year behind, uh, behind Vladimir. Well, Vladimir Salnikov in lane four. The Soviets are hoping for a new world record. They are expecting a gold medal for this team captain. 26 years of age, a resident of Moscow. He swims on the Soviet Army team. In the beginning, they're just checking out each other. They're not really looking. There might be a rabbit who might decide to go out with Vladimir, but, uh, you know, we just have to wait and see. Well, right now, the lead is down at the bottom or on the left of your screen. That's John Witchell from the United States. He was a victor in the 200 freestyles earlier in the competition, but still, it's all, the race is only 20% completed at this point. Nobody has really broken from the pack yet, and that might help the Americans a little bit. If Vladimir decides not to go out for it, they might have a chance at the end. Now remember, this is a squad of, of, uh, of people who did not make the USA World Championship team. A lot of people accused them of being less than our best. Accused the American Swimming Organization of not providing the finest athletes for this competition. But there is a chance that they could beat the world record holder, or former world record holder, Vladimir Salikov, the lead now. Up in lane number two, Scott Brackett of the United States. He trains out of Mission Bay Aquatic Club down in Boca Raton, Florida. He's a graduate of Arizona State in the white cap flipping at the top of the screen. He said he felt really good in, in warm-up today. The 1,500 finishing so, such a strong race there really helped his confidence. Confidence is certainly not lacking. The man is still holding on to a slim margin over the Soviet, Vladimir Salnikov. Two of them are looking at each other as they breathe, facing each other at this point of the race. In fact, all the Americans are still hanging on with the pack. Rowdy, they talk about losing the field. How do you, how do you get lost in a swimming pool? How do you get lost in a swimming pool? What a great question. I think one thing they've got to do is he, they've got to make a decision when they want to try to lose the field. That's the big question. Sort of like track and field when the athletes are making surges in long distance running. Vladimir Salnikov appears to have made a brief surge at this point. Sean Killing in the United States in the lane immediately adjacent is trying to hang on. They're slightly behind world record pace, but Vladimir in the past has been known to negative split the race, meaning he comes back faster than, when he, than, than he went out in. Vladimir Salnikov now holding on to the lead. The crowd sensing another gold medal for their favorite son. So here's where he starts to make his move right now. Right next to him is Sean Killian from the United States. If he stays with him just long enough, maybe he has a chance coming home. There's a good picture. He's about a half body length behind right now. Vladimir breathing every three strokes. Real, in, real smooth, real in control. 
Those bells you hear are the officials indicating two lengths of the pool. Remaining, Kalnikoff with seven tenths of a second lead over second place American Sean Killian. In third right now, Scott Brackett, graduate of the University of Arizona. Holding on, you see all three of them on your picture. The white cap at the top, that's Scott Brackett, but the man without the cap. The Soviet. Soviet treasure, Vladimir Salmakov. Vladimir's really carrying Sean to a great race here. It's going to be a good race coming home. Sean Killian wisely using the drag to wait, coming off of Salmakov. And we do have a race coming here. Sean Killian refusing to let Salmakov break away. Salmakov now realizing that the challenge is now a sprint. It's no this longer a distance. This could be a huge upset. Event. Let's go to get on the top of your screen. Scott Brack, and he's right there with him, too. And it's going to be a very exciting race with... This Sean could be Killian. a huge upset. Sean Killian breathing to his left, watching Salikov. Salikov putting everything he's got into the final finish. It's going to be it Sean is. Killian of the United Sean States Killian. upset. Kingpin. Vladimir Salikov, he smiles at the result. The, old, the, old, the second time he's been beaten in eight years in that event. What a great race. Young 18-year-old out of Cherry Hill, New Jersey, swims for the Jersey Wahoos and is enrolling at Cal Berkeley next year. He has got a smile on his face. He knows what he has done. A most remarkable come-from-behind finish, a full body length lead. He had to make up. He made it up, and he caught it with nine one-hundredths of a second remaining. An outstanding final swim for Sean Killian of the United States. Vladimir Salikov having to settle for a silver medal and the third-place award goes to Scott Brackett, also from the United States. Take a look at this. Here field. they come, right in. He just had, he had a longer touch right there, and Vladimir took another half stroke, which I think might have hurt him. Let's don't forget Scott Bracken on the top of your screen. He got, had a great race, got in, uh, came in third place. Three very good times for all three swimmers. The 351.9 would have won the gold medal in any of the last two Olympic Games. Well, with an upset victory for the United States, a very happy Sean Killian down on pool deck. We've got Nancy Hogshead with this event's winner. On a big upset, what did you think before the race? Well, um, it's a little bit nervous. Some of the greatest distance swimmer ever lived. But last night he had to swim the 1500, and I, I didn't. So I thought that might be the edge. But I didn't, you know. Being someone like Solnikov is just something you don't believe you can, especially this being my first international meet. At what point did you know that you had beaten him? Um, I saw when I was with him with 100 to go. I knew I could give him a race. And it's coming off, and I was catching the last 50. I was very confident at that point. Well, congratulations. A fine swim. Well, a very modest new kingpin in the distance events. First time on a national trip, Sean Killian taking the gold medal away from the local favorite. In fact, the crowd is still stunned into silence. The gold medal time, 351.91. The Soviet, 9 one hundredths of a second back at 352 even. And the bronze medal goes to Scott Brackett of the United States, 352.31. A stunning story from the U.S. swimming team here in Moscow. Nobody thought any of these kids could beat anybody when they came here. And there, an 18-year-old from Cherry Hill, New Jersey, who's going to the University of California, Berkeley, who's never been out of the United States before, just upset his idol. Victor Saldikov's picture is on the wall in the bedroom at his Cherry Hill, New Jersey home of Sean Killian. What a wonderful moment for that American teenager, and what a wonderful moment I'm sure it'll be for him for years to come. Of course, he'll never forget it, and we hope you enjoyed it. By the way, speaking of the great Victor uh, Sel uh, Vladimir uh, Salnikov, uh, he is going to be interviewed by John Neighbor, we hope, a little while later. John Neighbor is going to be leaving the swimming venue, and we hope to bring uh, Vladimir Salnikov here to our studios for an interview with John Neighbor. Of course, he remains a peerless swimmer. He'll be headed into the World Championships now. Just ahead, women's basketball. USA team will be playing Czechoslovakia. Stay with us as our coverage of the Goodwill Games continues. U.S. women's basketball team, led by the flamboyant Cheryl Miller, goes up against Czechoslovakia at the Druzba Multi-Purpose Arena. The women's basketball tournament is now in its third day, and the U.S. is on course for a medal. Rick Berry and Bill Russell set the scene and take us into the action. 
The teams are preparing for the third game in these Goodwill Games competition. The United States team, very impressive last night in their victory over Brazil, 91 to 70, and the second half in particular. They're going up against the Czechoslovakian team that has not won a ball game yet in these competitions. And, Bill, I really don't think that the Czechoslovakian team is up to the task of coming up with a victory. And that's what worries me, Rick, because uh, upsets. And these, these are, are brought about by a situation just like this. Yesterday, the Bra um, Brazilian team created quite a challenge for the American team, and they were ready for it. They were sky high. Now, today, they come with a team that they don't think can play. And if you're not careful with a good, experienced team, like the Czechoslovakian team, you can be upset. They have a good inside game and a pretty good outside game. They haven't put it together yet in this competition, but if you go in there overconfident and not really ready, they can cause problems. Now, what does, do the Americans have to do to come away with a victory in this game? They have to run, shoot, and rebound. And they want to make the Czechoslovakian team play the whole court. Not get into a half-court game, because if they do, an experienced team can really give you problems in a half-court game, especially on international rules. So we can look for the American team to play very similar to the way they came away with a victory against Yugoslavia in game number one, which, of course, is the pressing full-court attacking type of a defense to get into the wide-open court game. Let's take a look at how the standings are so far in the competitions. The team in first place by virtue of points would be Brazil. They have played earlier today. They came away with a victory against the Yugoslavian team, so they have five points. However, the United States and the Soviet Union team remain undefeated, and the rest of the teams following with their point totals. So after the competition today, it more than likely should be the United States and the Soviet Union both undefeated. And what would have to be a surprise to a lot of people, the United States team leading by only four, 22 to 18, with 7.05 left here in the first half as the Czechoslovakian team turns the ball over. Assistant coach Sylvia Hatchell, along with some of the other American teams on the bench, very concerned about the way this game is transpiring. Excellent pass. Cheryl Miller to Weatherspoon. She can't get it to drop. Kept alive by Katrina McLean. She goes back up strong, and she'll go to the free throw line as the foul is committed by Kalushikova. Kalushikova. We don't want her to be upset that we mispronounced her name, though. But the American team is shooting the ball so poorly. And one of the reasons for that is the defense. Now, they, when they're going inside, it looks like an easy shot. They're getting banged in the lower body all the time. Now, the thing is, if they had some good outside shooters, they can open things up a little bit more inside by hitting a couple of outside shots. But they have not been able to do that. And as a result, that Czechoslovakian defense is just swarming all over them inside. Well, they, as they, the old cliche, they're packing the paint defensively. Teresa Edwards with the rebound off the McLean miss, so it turns into a three-point play for the United States. Four points now for Teresa Edwards, and the United States leads by seven. Their biggest lead was eight, with 11.03 left in the first half. Cheryl Miller knocks it off of the Czechoslovakian girl, and quickly they advance the ball up the court. Cammy Etheridge looking very concerned indeed. Well, what's happening with the American team? They're playing good defense, and it's going to pay off for them eventually. They're not playing good, such good offense. Good Look what I found. Yes, Cheryl, Cheryl Miller. Miller. <laughs> Cheryl with eight points in the game. The biggest lead for the United States. They lead by nine. 27 to 18. Well, but they're, keeping the pressure, Rick, they're keeping the pressure on. It's going to pay off for them over the period of the game. But the Czechoslovakians are playing as well as they can play. Three-point try. Count it. The second three-pointer knocked in by Koloshikova. That cuts it to a six-point lead for the United States. 27-21, six minutes left, first half. There's that swarming defense by the Czechoslovakians. They say it's going to be United States ball. Now, this is the problem that you have as Kami Etheridge comes into the ball game with the, the way the American team is playing, though, with showing no threat of an outside game. There, as you say, pack the paint. And the perfect example there, number six, Kalushikova came in and was able to knock the ball loose. Fortunately for the U.S. team, it went off of a Czechoslovakian player's foot. Cheryl Miller fixing your shoe. That's what the delay is right here. And we're ready to go. Cheryl will be taking the ball out of bounds. It's a good shot of Cheryl. Cheryl, one of the most physical and aggressive players that the American team has. Three seconds as McLean stood in the lane to watch Jennifer Gillum. They will not allow you to get away with being in the three-second area in international competition. They're very quick with the whistle on that play. Jennifer Gillum with the defense. Not a very good shot on the part of Dobr Dobrovichova. Bad pass by Teresa Edwards. And the United States continuing 
to play erratic basketball, turning the ball over on a regular basis. And the long lead pass, traveling is called on the part of Goldava. Well, she made some cute little steps, but she advanced. That's why they call it. When you go sideways, they don't call it. Five and a half minutes to play here in the first half. The United States leading by six. Jennifer Gillum, tough angle on that shot. And Cammie Etheridge, smallest American player on the court right now, pulls it down. Cheryl Miller got banged, no foul. Rebound taken away by Yalaba. Back comes United, the Czechoslovakian team. And your old buddy, the captain, Hanna, is in the game. Hanna Zavrivuevska. Jennifer Gillum with the rebound on the long shot. Jennifer Gillum is having a long day already. She's playing very physical inside, but she's not able to get anything to drop. Just look at that Czechoslovakian team. Watch it. It'll collapse inside. Knocked away. Good defensive play by Dobry Vichova. And the long lead pass down the court to Hanna, and she lays it in. Nice play by the captain. Hanna Zarivuevska cuts it to a four-point United States lead now. They did lead by nine only two minutes ago. Katrina McLean, wide open, good pass, Cheryl Miller, and that's the type of plays they need. Get some cuts to the basket rather than being so stationary, She's Bill. The second cutter, uh, Gillen, Jennifer Gillen went through first, opened it up, and she stayed right down the lane, it was wide open. Last touch by the United States, Czechoslovakian ball. But I like to see him moving more rather than being so stagnant. If you're stationary and throw it in, you can really pack in on them. From 15 feet. Dubrovichova can't get it to drop. Czechoslovakians get another chance. And they're lucky to get it back. Hanna again from the outside gets the back. Hanna Zarivuevka. 29-25. Make it 31-25 as Teresa Everett answers for the United States. Teresa has six points in the ball game. We haven't seen Ann Donovan for quite a while, Bill. And the reason for that is they're using the pressing defense and they're using uh, quick people. Uh, usually in that case, she might not even have... Oh, nice shot inside by Dubrovichova. Dubrovichova cuts it back to a six-point, four-point lead for the United States. Well, usually Jennifer Gillum nor Ann Donovan are in if they're really going to go to the press. They usually are bringing Carissa Davis. She hasn't even seen any action as Cheryl Miller makes an excellent reverse move. Cheryl now leads the scoring. She has 10 points. The U.S. leads by six. Tammy Etheridge called for the foul, and she was Garling Kalushakova. And now Clarissa Davis, number 11, is entering the ball game for the United States, along with Ann Donovan. Fran Harris also coming in as Kay Yao electing to put some fresh troops into the ball game. There's a timeout on the court. The United States, 33. The Czechoslovakians, 28, with 2.56 left to play first half. Rick Barry, along with Bill Russell, and what has been a very big surprise the Czechoslovakian team is trailing by only four as Clarissa Davis misses that shot, and the Czechoslovakians come away with it. 33, 29, 240 left to play, but Bill, your crystal ball was working. Before the game, you thought this is exactly what was going to happen to the United States, that they weren't up enough mentally for this game. And this team, uh, an experienced team, can make you play poorly. They're, they're shooting, the shooting is atrocious. And I, and I don't think it's just because they're just not shooting well, I think the Czech defense, because it's so physical, in, especially inside, they're not making anything inside because you're getting hit every time you shoot, and they're not calling it because it's not a foul in the international basketball. Cynthia Cooper knocks it out of bounds, knocks it away from the captain, Hanna Zarivuevska. Goldova inbounds it. Jana Stanova comes away. Mary Ann Stanley with a look of bewilderment on her face. Cammy Etheridge gets it over to the sideline to Fran Harris, and Fran pops it in. Fran, a good shooter from that area, kicks it back up to a six-point advantage for the U.S., 35-29. Just under two minutes left to play. Clarissa Davis knocks it out of bounds. Clarissa Davis, the most valuable player for that University of Texas team that went undefeated in the NCAAs. And 
Donovan laying off, not going out to put pressure on, trying to clog that middle up and hopefully come up with some blocks like she did against Brazil last night when she came up with seven of them. Cynthia Cooper called for the foul, reaching in. Obviously, she didn't think it was a good call. That will be the penalty. And that will send Bill's girlfriend, Hannah, to the free throw line. <laughs> <laughs> you know your girlfriend. You don't even know her last name, though, Bill. You can't. That name, everyone's a killer. Zari Buesca. Zari Buesca. Zari Buesca. <laughs> She's played in four European championships. One of the more experienced players on this Czechoslovakian team. She cuts it to a five-point deficit for Czechoslovakia. Biggest lead of the game was nine points. Back with 6:20 left to play here in the first half. 27 to 18, the U.S. team led. Now it's a four-point lead for the American women. And Donovan is fouled, and the foul from behind is being called against Dobrovichova. That will send Ann Donovan to the free-throw line. Some of the Czechoslovakian women look on. That's Teresa Edwards. I guess the cameraman likes Teresa Edwards. And Donovan, who's been playing basketball over in Japan since her graduation from Old Dominion. She has to be quite a novelty, a six foot eight inch American woman in Japan. Just six eight. Yeah, just six eight, right? <laughs> and Donovan now with eight points in the ball game. The United States team up by six, 70, 37 to 31. Minute 20 left to play in the first half. Another three-point try for Czechoslovakia. That Good one will drop. Up. Good block by Ann Donovan. Yet another try for the Czechoslovakian team and capped that basket by Jana Shkinova. And the Czechoslovakian team hangs tough, trailing by four, 37-33, as an anxious U.S. bench looks on. Draws a lot of white shirts around. There are three of them to be exact, and the foul being called against Hanna Zarivueska. So Fran Harris to the free throw line to the United States team. United States team, I don't know, Bill. I can't remember an outside shot. The furthest shot I can remember being made was perhaps that 10 footer on the left baseline by Fran Harris. That's about the only outside shot that they made in this ball game. They're not looking when they're out there. Well, I think they need to, to open up things inside. The way the Czechoslovakians are, are closing up the middle, their shooting percentage inside is horrible. And as you pointed out, the officials are not calling the fouls. And as a result, they've had a terrible shooting percentage here in the first half. And they're not getting their fast breaks as much as they could because they're not controlling the boards. You've got to control the boards. Long lead pass to Kisilkova, who came in and scored a basket. Excellent pass on the part of Kalushikova. Kalushikova to Kisilkova. That's Kisilkova who knocked that one in. She had seven points in the game. And again, it's a four-point United States lead. We have 40 seconds left in the first half. Foul going to be called. Offensive pick against Clarissa Davis. That's the penalty and a chance for the Czechoslovakian team. Know that it's not going to be the penalty. It's going to be the ball on the sideline because of the offensive foul. Thirty seconds left to play. That's Kisilkova. The United States team will get another opportunity unless they give up an offensive rebound. Hanna with the drive, foul by Clarissa Davis. Hanna Zarivueska will go to the free throw line. Clarissa Davis with the foul. There's 17 seconds left to play in the first half. She's gonna call a technical foul if she doesn't put her hand up. She finally does. The official is about to call a technical, which is very costly in international rules. But Clarissa not playing particularly well. As we pointed out in the game against Brazil yesterday, Bill, she didn't get into later in the game, but she makes a lot of mistakes. She's a young player. Uh, not a lot of experience at all in international competition. And, and the big thing is, is that she'll make mistakes, but sometimes she can, then she'll come back with a great play because of her great natural ability. She'll get to go to the free throw line because the foul was called that time against Jana Zinova, who pushed off. So Clarissa will go to the free throw line. Katrina McLean looking on, concerned, and that's Clarissa. One and one. 
believe Carissa had 24 points in that championship game against USC in the NCAA tournament. Fine, gifted athlete. And there she gets it back. Good block on the part of the Czechoslovakians. That was Dubrovichova who came away with it. Final 10 seconds. Kiselkova, three seconds. Three-point try by Hanna. Kiselkova gets it back. That basket would not have counted had it gone on the shot by Dobry Fichova. And the United States team and head coach Kay Yao are going to have quite a bit to talk about. At the end of the first half, their lead is a slim one. They lead 39 to 35. Just to visually update you once again on the venues for the competition in the Goodwill Games, the women's basketball being played at Druzhba Multipurpose Gymnasium. That is down in the area of the Lenin Stadium on the southwest side of Moscow, just near the Moscow River. And we'll be right back with more on the Goodwill Games coverage for 1986. Please stay with us. After the first day of competition in the heptathlon, when we left you yesterday, we reported that uh, the American, Jackie Joyner, was leading in the heptathlon, and not only leading, but was actually on a world record pace. However, we should also point out that Jackie Joyner is looking over his shoulder at the holder of the world record, uh, Sabina Pates from East Germany, and of course her American teammate, Jane Frederick, is also uh, in the race there. So let's join Leandra Riley now and check in on the heptathlon. For the 8 million citizens of Moscow, Lenin Stadium is the focal point of sports competition. Today it is an international focal point for the Goodwill Games track and field event. Hello everyone and welcome to our continuing coverage of the women's heptathlon. We have seven disciplines in the heptathlon and we have five countries represented. Four events have already been completed and the three events remaining are the long jump, the javelin throw and the 800 meter run. Let's review the standings after four events after the first day. Jackie Joyner ahead, 4,151 points. And then there's a strong East German block in here. Anke Bemmer, Sybil Thiel, Sabine Pates, and Jane Frederick is in sixth place with 3,815. Our first event of today's competition, the long jump. Jackie Joyner and East Germany Sabine Pates have both jumped over 23 feet in their career. So it's actually too close to pick a clear favorite. But right now, let's begin our competition with one of those strong East German athletes. Her name is Anke Bemmer. And Anke Bemmer has one minute and 30 seconds to jump from the time that the official gives her the signal that it is clear in the pit to do so. And she elects to take most of that time trying to tune out some of the distractions here at Lenin Central Stadium. As you can hear in the background, there are a lot of public address announcements. <laughs> And for Anke Bemmer, it is 21 feet, 6 inches. And Jackie Joyner will be waiting in the wings, waiting for that 7,000-point total. A good jump means she can rest and not take her other two attempts, so she's going to try to put it all in her first attempt. But right now, let's go back to the long jump hit, where another member of that powerful East German block is about to compete, world record holder in the heptathlon, Sabine Pates. And for Pates, that is not a good attempt at all. The marker will show 21 feet even. But for Jackie Joyner, this is her first attempt. And it is worth 23 feet, and that means 1,176 points. So she will pass on her next two attempts to rest for the javelin. Jackie has become a wise competitor since her silver medal days in Los Angeles, and her efforts are not being unnoticed by the paparazzi. For Jackie Joyner, this could become a decision of not whether or not she's going to break the world record, but rather by how much. Going back to the long jump competition is Sybil Thiel of East Germany, currently in third place in the point totals. She could climb with a good effort here.
And that is an excellent jump. 21 feet, 8 and 3 quarters inches worth over 1,000 points. She'll climb in the point totals. Recapping the long jump results, as you see, a happy Sybil Teal, Jackie Joyner, our winner, 23 feet. That's a world best in the heptathlon, incidentally. Teal and Chubitnova are in second and third. Our point totals then look like this. Jackie Joyner, 5,327. But let's go down after the East German blocks. We have two ladies from the Soviet Union, and Jane Frederick of the United States is in 10th now with 4,609. Jackie Joyner is the American record holder in the heptathlon. That was set in May with 6,841 points. Since winning the silver medal in the 1984 Olympics, she's been trying uh, to focus on the shot put and the javelin in her training. The 24-year-old athlete hopes to become the first woman to break the 7,000-point barrier in the heptathlon. Here is our Goodwill profile. I enjoy competing in the heptathlon because it gives me a chance to explore different events. If I do bad in one event, there are six more events I can concentrate on. I found out when I just concentrate on one event, I get bored. Among the seven, I enjoy the long jump the most because I grew up as a long jumper. I feel that's my event. 21, 22, 23. Jackie loves track and field. And her determination to be the best at what she does, I think, is, is her greatest gift. Everything up, through the board, quicken, 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 quick. Work the board, stay tall. When the pressure is on, Jackie does well because she is determined to do well. So really speed up the rope, really. And so if she's not going to win the gold medal, but she's going to, for lack of a better word, die trying. So from the middle, from your first three, to four, five, six, seven, eight, you're really pulling those knees up. I like to compete. Hot, I like okay. to perform, and I like to be ready to go when the top people right are there. there. I'm going for it. I would like to pursue a career in sports casting, and so far it's been working out pretty good. Hopefully in the future, be bigger and brighter things for me. Jackie Joyner is a great pressure athlete because of her motivation to succeed in the toughest situation. She is the greatest all-around athlete to ever be in the UCLA Women's Athletic Program. Worry about the other players. High on the toes, high on the toes, good strong legs. Well, at the beginning, there were some difficulties coaching Jackie uh, being my wife. And I think Jackie and I had to get the understanding that Bob Kersey is a coach and Jackie Joyner is a fantastic athlete. You to gradually start working that arms on the curve and you give me everything you got down that straightaway. Last event, last 200 meters. This and that's one of the reasons why she's known as Jackie Joyner and not Jackie Ready? Joyner Kersey. I want to be known as a That's coach, it. and I want her on, to be known as the athlete. Bring it home, bring it home, come on, come on, come on, build it, build it, build it. Come Bobby's on. a very demanding person, and being out on the track, he's demanding, and then also on. coming home, he's demanding. Your legs are dead, you gotta go to the arms, your legs are dead. Jackie's good for me. I'm kind of a hard person to get along with. Uh, she tolerates my, uh, my frustrations as a coach. She tolerates Bob Kersey. I don't think the situation is difficult as far as Bobby and I seeing each other all day long. So far, it's been pretty good. As far as losing the gold medal by three points in the heptathlon, at first it, it hurt. <laughs> it hurt really bad. And I realized that I can do better. And if God spared my life, I know when a gold medal eventually is going to come to me. Jackie says she finds the heptathlon well-suited to her disposition. She can't bear the tedium of concentrating on only one sport. In fact, she often plays racquetball and basketball to supplement her workouts. A lot of energy expended there. Let's return now to the competition between the United States and Czechoslovakia and the women's basketball. When we left the game, the score was 39-35 at halftime. Let's go back to second half action. Bringing you the start of the second half of this ball game, a game that has been very surprising. Well, not to Bill, because he predicted this one with his magic crystal ball, saying that this was the one team that he felt that the United States team could conceivably lose to and that they wouldn't be ready for it. And obviously, with the score 39 to 35, uh, the United States team is playing their poorest game thus far of the tournament as Ann Donovan will go to the free throw line, the foul being committed 
against number 12, Erica Dobro Dobrovichova. Now, what uh, the American team is going to have to do, Rick, this second half, they're going to have to be careful. Play hard and play pretty much the same way. This one is a game that you can win it, but it's a struggle. United States shooting 76% from the free throw line prior to that miss by Ann Donovan, who was three for three from the field in the first half, Bill. I would think that they might want to try and use her inside and take advantage of that height because Jennifer Gillum was rather ineffective 0 for 4 from the field in the first half. Mary Ann Stanley, one of the assistant coaches, looking on. Five-point lead for the United States. That's Kitokova. And the rebound by Dubrovichova. Dubrovichova with seven points in the game. Four Czechoslovakians with seven points each. Etheridge with the pass off to Donovan, the foul against Kisilkova. That will be the American ball on the sideline. Kisilkova now with four personal fouls. Two other Czechoslovakian girls playing with three. Dubrovichova, one of them. The other one is Jana Stinova. Cheryl Miller tied up for a jump ball. Substitute right away coming into the game for Kisokova with four fouls. She goes to the bench. The captain, Hanna Zarivueska. Cheryl up against Goldava. Same team that started the game for the United States. Etheridge and Edwards in the backcourt as the foul is called by Goldava. Or Goldava. And I noticed that the uh, Czech team starting the second half is even more aggressive defensively. They're trying to keep contact. That way they can offset the quickness. McLean from Edwards. Katrina McLean score the basket. She'll go to the free throw line. Foul going against Janosh Denova, number five. Front line for the United States team, Ann Donovan, Katrina McLean, and also Cheryl Miller. Cheryl Miller led the, is leading the way for the United States, 10 points, 9 points for Ann Donovan, 9 points also for Katrina McLean. Make it 10 now for Katrina. I still think I'll give you the 10 points, Bill. I told you that yesterday. The United States would win by 10 or more. Three-point try. Will not drop for Goldova. Back come the Americans. Etheridge to Edwards, who loses it out of bounds. She's not having a really, really good day, I'd say, Rick. Not like the game she had last night against Brazil. She played exceptionally well on both ends of the court in that one. The pressure by the American team. And Donovan tries to come out and do it. Etheridge tries to come in to help. Cheryl Miller knocks it away. Good save by Etheridge. Cheryl Same Miller called travel. for traveling. <laughs> Six-point lead for the American team. 43 to 37. 18, 15 remaining to play in the ball game. Dubrovichova. McLean for the United States. Etheridge to Miller. To Donovan, nice movement, nice shot by Ann Donovan. Excellent pass by Cheryl Miller because if you know about Donovan's hands, that was a good pass. You got to float him in there. You can't throw it with too much on it. 11 points for Ann Donovan, an eight-point lead for the American team. Their biggest lead was nine with 6.20 left in the first half. Three-point drive by Hanna, blocked by Edwards. Ann Donovan has it knocked away, and the Czechoslovakians come away with it. Lushakova gets it over to Hanna. Three-point try. Cheryl Miller battles. She comes away with it. Three against two for the Americans. Etheridge on the right. Nice pass by Cheryl Miller. And that's the type of ball the American team has got to play. The biggest lead of the game. They lead now by 10. And those were two excellent passes by Cheryl Miller. 47-37. The American team starting to take control. Sports Arena, where the United States team has their biggest lead of the game, 47-37. We have 17 minutes and five seconds remaining. And Bill K. Yao, whatever she said at the halftime, it worked. Good 
defense, bad pass on the part of the Rove Vichiva. The Rove Vichiva, number 12, and now the United States throws it away again. They had 12 turnovers in the first half. And now a turnover for the Czechoslovakian team. Quickly come, comes Cammy Etheridge to Cheryl Miller. Cheryl got hit. The basket counts. She should have been to the free throw line. Cheryl Miller now with 12 points in the ball game. The biggest lead for the United States at 12. And Cheryl Miller has been instrumental, very, very prominent in this, tur in this turnaround to give the American team a reasonably comfortable lead. Hana in, block, Cheryl Miller. And Cheryl is pumped. Look at her. <laughs> she has such enthusiasm. Kalushakova has it blocked by Edwards. McLean, Travel. call for traveling. And Kisokova playing with four fouls now will be back into the ball game. Obviously, head coach John Carger wants to get his best player in before this game gets totally out of control. The U.S. leading by 12, 39, I mean 49 to 37. And Donovan and McLean, and they're going to call the Katrina McLean. That will send Yana Shistanova to the free throw line. Only the first foul by the U.S. team here in the second half. We've played almost four minutes. 16.04 remaining. Finally, Czechoslovakia is able to get a point on the scoreboard here. And Donovan with another rebound. Cheryl Miller wide open. McLean, excellent pass as Cheryl made a good cut. Cheryl now is doing it all. Lead me away. A great move without the ball to get open for that play. That was, just, that was one of the better moves of the day. Three players in double figures for the United States. Miller, Donovan, and McLean. The Czechs have no one in double figures. Miller on Kiselkova. Cheryl got a hand on that one. Shot clock is down to five for the Czechoslovakians, and they're in trouble. Knocked away by Donovan. The shot clock with one left. Dubrovichova got it up, but McLean controls. That horn was an inadvertent horn for the 30-second clock that should have been restarted. Edwards, excellent pass to Donovan. Three seconds called. We told you in the first half, you do not have an opportunity to camp in the lane in international <laughs> competition. Teresa Edwards, I mean, the Teresa Weatherspoon, and Cynthia Cooper are looking on from the bench, cheering on their teammates. 51 to 38. 13-point lead. Dubrovitrova inside. Donovan looked like she might have gotten a jump ball, but instead they call the foul against Dan. Yeah, it's really funny. I, I still haven't gotten it, Rick, what constitutes a foul and what does not constitute a foul on a shot. Well, you get hit one time, it's not a foul, and you just almost incidental contact, another time it's a foul. Well, you saw head coach K. Yao there probably wondering the exact same thing, Bill. <laughs> I think it may just kind of be whatever the official seems to feel at that moment. There was a lot of contact. I mean, Cheryl Miller went in and made a couple of baskets in this ball game where she was bumped very severely, and no foul was called. Dubrovichova cuts it to a 12-point U.S. lead. 14.40 left to play. And Donovan. McLean, good, strong rebound. And Donovan again. And with 13 points. Biggest lead now for the American team at 14 foul, Cheryl Miller. Jennifer Gillum will be coming into the ball game along with Fran Harris. And Donovan goes to the bench. 
along with Teresa Edwards. That's Jennifer Gillum. Had a tough first half. She couldn't get anything dropped for her offensively. Fran Harris called for the foul as she reached in to help double team along with Cami Etheridge. And that's the kind of defense our Coach Yao wants. Helping out double teaming because this is a pretty experienced team. Although they're not that good. But if you let them play, they can hurt you. Of course, you're still is talking about this Czechoslovakian ball club. They have not won a game yet in the tournament. No basket. Traveling is called. Hanna Zarivuevska does not get the score. Remains a 14-point lead. And Fran Harris gets a tough roll as she tries to bank it in off the glass. Cheryl Miller with a steal and no basket. Two free throws for Cheryl, however. Foul called against Yalaba, number 14 for Czechoslovakia. There's their head coach, Jan Karger. Rick, would you agree that uh, the two most talented players in this tournament are number the Sil not this yeah, the Silva for Brazil and Cheryl Miller. We just yes, all, all around talent. All around talent. I would agree. There are so many different things for this De Silva Apollo. De Silva is a really outstanding player. I think she's the best player. I think she's even better than Cheryl Miller all around, though. I mean, and Cheryl is an outstanding player. I give her the edge because of her better outside shooting. To uh, Paula De Silva? Yes. She took a three-pointer, count it. And that narrows the gap now to 12, 54, 42. Inside of 13, 40, left to play in the ball game. McLean. Nice, strong move inside by Katrina McLean. And she's having a fine performance. This is the best that she's played since the early minutes of that game against Yugoslavia before she had that injury to her right thigh. McLean has 12 points in this game. Nice pass inside from behind. That's going to be Jennifer Gillen committing the foul. That will send Irma Yalava to the free throw line. With 13.08 left to play in this ball game, the United States has taken control. They lead 56 to 42. Well, whether or not you agree that uh, Maria De Silva might be a better basketball player than Cheryl Miller, Cheryl Miller is perhaps the best ever and recently became the first woman to be drafted by the United States Basketball League. She went to the Staten Island Stallions in the 15th round, one round after Michael Ray Richardson. Known for her flamboyant personality, both on and off the court, Cheryl is now pursuing an acting career. Here's our Goodwill profile. I think women's basketball has has definitely grown over the last 10 and 12 years. You can just tell by, you know, let's say 10 or 12 years ago, one college would dominate for four and five years. Well, it's not like that anymore. I think the, the championship itself, the title, is always changing hands every year. I think the longest any uh, college team has been able to hold is two years. Uh, the talent is increasing. Women are starting at a very young age. There's no longer fears of getting out there and competing with men in a male sport. The athletes, the kids, was first started basically because of Stephanie Alexander. Um, uh, Elise called me into her office one day and said that uh, Stephanie uh, wanted to see me and that she was diagnosed with having leukemia. Well, I think the program, Athletes for Kids, will really help a lot of the children who are hospitalized um, and later on in their course of therapy. I was just glad that I was able to make some type of an impact in her life. Since I'm in Hollywood, I decided to go into acting and pursue that career also. Sports. It's all he ever thinks about. Sports, sports, sports. He's a man possessed, I swear. You know, I knew he was in the games, but I never expected anything like this. I guess I should have suspected something on a first date. When he insisted I come back to his place, and then... When I got there, he showed me his collection of baseball trading cards. Well, anyways, he's, he's flipped out on sports, gone. And it's ruining our relationship. 
He doesn't even got time for sex anymore. Because of events? I tell you, Ron may be bowling 300, but in the bedroom, he's throwing gutter balls. Well, it's, it's very frustrating being a, a, a female basketball player in a sense that, A, if I was Michael Jordan or Patrick Ewing, I could sign a $2.4 million contract and, you know, and, and that would be my life story. Who's zooming who there? Cheryl is believed to be the first woman ever to dunk in organized competition. That dunk came during a high school game back in 82. But during her sophomore year at USC, she missed a dunk and vowed never to try it again. We'll stay tuned to find out about that. So far tonight, 16 points she's got in the game that we're televising and bringing to you. And Turner Network Television's Goodwill Games coverage continues after this break. United States team still in control, leading by 12 points. However, they had a 20-point lead just a little over a minute and a half ago. They have not played well, and there's an example of the type of play that they've been coming up with. This has been a very poor performance when they had this game basically a blowout, and Coach K. Yao not taking any chances right now, bringing Cheryl Miller and Ann Donovan back in off the bench to replace Fran Harris and Jennifer Gillum. As a coach, Bill, I know that you don't like to see that type of play. Same thing happened against Brazil in the game yesterday. Three-point try. By Eva Kalushikova. And all of a sudden, it's a nine-point lead only for the American team. Still 140 left to play. And Kayao has to be very discouraged with what's been taking place. The traveling call against Katrina McLean. And the United States continues to play very sloppy basketball here in the last two and a half minutes. Minute and a half left. is at 10. And Donovan hammered on that one. Rebound taken away by Jana Shistina. Traveling call. Traveling on that play by Jana Shistinova. Soviet team could very well be watching this well, a mini collapse on the part of the American team. They have seen it happen in two consecutive games now where the United States not able to sustain the big lead that they had. And Donovan puts an end to the drought that the American team experienced when they were up by 20. It's the first two points that they've scored in the last, well, almost three and a half minutes. Final 30 seconds of play. Now, if they were to do that type of playing against the Soviet team, they could be in big trouble, Bill. Not if they had that kind of lead. Well, yeah. <laughs> Kay Yao, obviously, you could see the look at her face. Uh, well, they had a 20-point lead, and they relaxed and just want to finish the game out, which happens so often when you're, especially when you're having a bad game. Score of the basket. Foul against Ann Donovan. Her fourth. 13 seconds left to play. Back to a nine-point lead, and my 10 points don't look so good anymore. <laughs> They looked pretty strong a few minutes ago, Rich. Sure did. Morning. As I say, the, the American team has only come up with two points Man, in, I don't in know, almost three and a half minutes. Now, wait a minute, Rick. You can't get on them because they're they winning. Didn't, they didn't uh, beat the spread. <laughs> yeah, right. Listen, but the big thing is, in this kind of competition around Robin, if they came out with the same point total as the United States, as the uh, another team in the competition, the points scored a lot of times could be the determining factor. Cammy Etheridge... This is the shot right at the buzzer, and the United States team comes away with their third consecutive victory with a 78 to 70 win over the Czechoslovakian team. But it was not a very distinguished effort in the last three and a half minutes of this ball game. However, up to that point, they control the game from the start of the second half after leading by only four at the halftime. They played 16 minutes of outstanding basketball in the second half. Forget the last four minutes, but it's still a victory. 78 for the United States and 70 
for the Czechoslovakian. From Drew's Rust Sports Arena, this is Rick Barry for Bill Russell. Well, the U.S. women are now 3-0 and in basketball and appear headed on a collision course with the Soviet team on Thursday night. The Russian women also are undefeated as of now in women's basketball. So it could be a really good one on Thursday night as we look ahead to our continuing coverage of the Goodwill Games. We're also following some other women's events today, including the heptathlon and Jackie Joyner continues on that pace to break possibly break the world record i won't say awesome because that's a sports cliche but boy what a performance she's giving we had uh, javelin competition today uh, as part of our goodwill games coverage and let's join leander riley now for that call we're back on the field of lenin central stadium for our continuing coverage of track and field today's events are hampered by possibly too much sunshine and it's beginning to take its toll on some of the athletes and psychologically, it's making the Goodwill Flame burn that much hotter. Now that the long jump competition has concluded, we have just two events remaining in our coverage of the heptathlon. Our next event, the javelin. Each lady will receive three attempts. Incidentally, the javelin is one of the events that was added to the pentathlon to help make this event a heptathlon. Right now, let's take a look at how Jackie Joyner stands up in her quest for 7,000 points. In four of the five events that she has competed so far, she has set personal bests. Obviously, she is well on her way to a world record. We are ready now for our javelin competition. Our first competitor that we are going to show you is Jane Frederick. In 1985, Jane Frederick was ranked number one in America in the heptathlon. Unfortunately for her, this day, the javelin became a situation of good news and bad news. 34 minutes, 35.57 seconds. And you are witnessing the good news right now. That toss carried her to a total of 156.6 inches. The bad news is that she hurt her back on that Joyner toss and withdrew from the competition. Jackie Joyner for the point leader right here. A good throw here, and it's all but home. A great one, and it's the 800-meter walk coming up next. And I think Coach Kersey says it all. That was a great toss. 163 feet, 7 inches for Jackie Joyner. Larissa Nikitina of the Soviet Union actually won this particular event, but Jackie Joyner set another personal record for herself by over 3 feet. So let's take a look at our point totals. 7,000 points very much within reach of Jackie Joyner. 6,184. Sybil Thiel and Anke Bemmer of East Germany are in close pursuit. And Jane Frederick, even though she's going to pull out now, she is in 7th place at this point in the standings. When you think about what the folks in Moscow consume in terms of eating and drinking, you usually hear about borscht and you hear about vodka, but you don't hear a lot about ice cream. People in Moscow tend to eat a lot of ice cream. Seems like there's something about the short summer and the Goodwill Games that has brought this passion to a near frenzy. Richard Blystone has this report. They call it Moroznia, and it means frosty. But you don't need a dictionary to translate it. A handful of Siberia to beat the summer heat. Here, across the street from the Goom department store, another of Moscow's famous lines. But not because of any shortage, it's because here they serve up the best ice cream in town. If they had a term for junk food here, it would sound something like bizpalyeznaya yeda, but they don't. And if they did, it would have nothing to do with this stuff. It's as far from the scented, tinted, congealed vegetable oil you get in the West as borscht is from bubblegum. If you're looking for passion fruit ripple or banana aspirin crunch, you're in the wrong country. They claim to make half a dozen flavors here, 
but the choice is generally vanilla, vanilla, or vanilla. But nobody's complaining. Muscovites and visitors consume 170 tons of morozhnaya a day, summer and winter. And the Ministry of Ice Cream has decreed an extra 700 tons to cool the collective tonsils of the metropolis during the Goodwill Games. While the U.S. Embassy is warning people off the dairy products around Chernobyl, up here it says you'd have to eat an enormous amount of ice cream to sustain any harm. The trouble is, after waiting around for a couple of hours on a hot day like this, an enormous amount is exactly what you have in mind. For the Goodwill Games, I'm Richard Blystone. Earlier today, one of the highlights of our Goodwill Games coverage, you're looking at action from the men's 400-meter freestyle. The great Vladimir Salnikov of the Soviet Union had not been beaten since 1981 in this event, but a young 18-year-old from the United States by the name of Sean Killian has the lead in the race. It's stunning the audience and television viewers around. We're replaying it here. Sean Killian racing against his idol, the great Vladimir Salnikov and Killian wins it at the wire by just fractions of a second and sean killian an 18 year old who will be a freshman at the university of california berkeley defeats vladimir salnikov in the 400 meter men's freestyle race what an incredible exciting uh, event that took place in moscow time this afternoon we hope you enjoyed that as much as we did the women's 400 meter race is coming up at the swimming venue at the olympic swimming palace and there are a couple of of racers there that you should watch for. Anka Moring from East Germany, Naomi Lung from Romania, both very strong. Can the U.S. women insert a challenge? We'll find out. Let's join our swimming venue announcers right now. Well, it might appear that Vladimir Salnikov's stunning swimming in the distance events has stolen a lot of the media attention in those longer races. But you know, it's in those very same longer swims that the young American women have chosen to excel. John, we've had three relatively unknown American swimmers do out exceptionally well here in the Goodwill Games. Leslie Dayland has already won two gold medals in the longer distance races, and we'll see here in the 400 if she has enough speed to win another gold. So let's get on with the 400-meter freestyle. Eight lengths of the pool, the world record held by Tracy Wickham of Australia, a 406.28 in the field. In lane zero, Eniko Palingsar from Romania. Amy Lung from Romania in one. She's won two IM so far this meet. Greet Richter from East Germany in two. Kathy Hetchy, a silver medalist in the 800. She's in three, United States swimmer. Anke Murring, East Germany. Andrea Oros from Hungary. Leslie Dayland in lane six, the young 17-year-old from California. Antoinette Strumenlieva in Bulgaria in seven. Little Janet Evans from Fullerton in eight. And Natalia Kuzmina from the Soviet Union in nine. And they're off. Eight lengths of the pool freestyle. What can we expect in the front half of this race, Tracy? Well, Leslie Dalen told me she's not known for her speed, and she doesn't want it to come down to a race at the end, so she, we may see her taking out. But Anke Mooring in lane four for the East Germany, she has not done as well as expected here, and I think she's hungry for a gold medal. She's going to fight the Americans in this short distance event. So the early lead at this point comes from lane one. Naomi Lung from Romania. She took it out very quickly and flipping first. Anke Mooring from East Germany, trying to establish the pace. One down, seven lengths remaining. 50-meter pool here at the Moscow Olympic Swim Stadium, the site of the 1980 Olympic swimming competition. And pace is important in a 400 freestyle. You've got some swimmers in here who have a little bit more speed, and then you've got some distance swimmers who kind of get into a rut. They're used to going at one speed, so they're going to try and set a pace that they can continue to hold for the next 300 meters. Well, if the first 25% of this race is completed, it looks like lane four, Anke Mering from East Germany, first split a 101.36. That is about two-tenths of a second slower than world record pace, but hanging with her is American Kathy Hetchy, 17-year-old out of State College, Pennsylvania, from swims on the team fox catcher. She's done well in distance swimming so far this meet, and I think she wants to prove something right here. I think she does, and it's great to see that she's not intimidated by swimming against some of the swimmers from the Eastern Bloc nations. These are relative newcomers on the American squad, and oftentimes, you may be a little bit scared to swim against people you don't know a lot about. And the unknown is the hardest thing to deal with. But she's not afraid, and she's trying to extend her lead right here. Well, indeed, it does look like the field is thinning out a bit there in the dark gap in the front of the field. That is Kathy Hetchy, United States of America, and currently in second place, the East German. 
Leslie Dalen saying, I can't let them get too far in front of me. I'm going to pick it up a little bit here and get right into the race. Leslie Dalen, perhaps one of the bigger stories in the swimming competition. She came into this her first national meet. Her coach, her father, was the head coach of the USA squad. And in her first three days of swimming competition, she won both distance freestyle events she entered. We had a chance to speak with her earlier about the burden of being a champion at such an early age. Well, I think when I went into the meet, I wasn't favored at all, and now I'm sort of a favorite. But I know that the East Germans are really strong, and I'm just going to have to go out there and do my best. Well, the pressure right now rests on Kathy Hetty's shoulders, United States, a 17-year-old. She's looking very strong almost halfway through, or three-quarters of the way through the women's 400-meter freestyle. Eight lengths to the pool, two and a half lengths remaining. And she is kicking very strongly, and she doesn't seem to be slowing down at all. She's got a nice rhythm going. You don't often see distance swimmers kicking as much as she is, but in this shorter race, I think she says, I'm going for it. The race now rests with three people for silver medal. Kathy Etchie leading right now, Leslie Dalen, Anki Murring, and Naomi Lung, the three swimmers fighting for the silver medal at this point. And they're a little bit behind world record pace. And you know, these distance swimmers can look at the scoreboard sometimes and see their split. So Kathy Hetchy probably knows where she is and what she needs to go to improve her time. She doesn't have anyone near her, and she's just going to try and come home the last hundred. Kathy Hetchy all alone, keeping her head high and looking forward on an occasional stroke, controlling the 400-meter race. The race right now for second place. Leslie Dayland in lane six from the United States, fighting to hold off the challenge by Hunky Murray and Naomi Long. It is a battle for second place. The three, Naomi Lung, Anki Mooring, and Leslie Dalen turned right together. Leslie may have to race for second place here. Well, Leslie Dalen said she didn't have the speed to keep up on the back half of this race, so she's got to make a major move at this point. Kathy Hetchy, United States, still controlling this race. Now in second place, it's the fight between the Romanian Naomi Lung and Anki Mooring of East Germany. Kathy Hetchy went out aggressively, and they're catching her a little bit, but she was too far in front. And the gold medal will go to Kathy Hetchy of the United States. Unofficially, her time of 4.11.53. Second place to the East German, Anki Möhring. Her time of 4.12.50. And in third place in lane one with a time of 4.12.53. Three one-hundredths of a second into the bronze. That's Naomi Lung. Look and at they, the replay. And they were catching her, but with that strong kick continued throughout the race. She touched right in front. She was just too far ahead for them to catch her. And second place, just by a hair, Anki Morin out touches Naomi Long from Romania. So the United States win another event in this final evening in competition. The time of 4.11.53, not a world record, but certainly one of the fastest times swum by an American this year. So the United States distance program looking very strong for the years to come. All these American swimmers having a good shot at the 1988 Olympics. The United States wins another gold medal here at the Goodwill Games in Moscow. The official result, Kathy Hetchy from the United States at 4.11.53 for the gold. East German Anki Mörning got the silver with a 4.12.50. And the Romanian Naomi Lung, winner of two individual gold medals in the IMs, gets the bronze in the 400 freestyle for time of 4.12.53. Well, every time we think we have the swimming figured out, Somebody comes in and surprises again, and that happened once again. The U.S. swimming team is literally surprising the world with the team that's here. And as they say, they are saying the best team is going to the world championships uh, coming up next month in August. So that should be interesting. You can bet a lot of those American swimmers are looking over their shoulders now, I'm sure, cheering uh, for their teammates right now. But uh, <laughs> I'm sure they're also looking over their shoulders. We'll have more swimming right after this. Fly. Four lengths of the pool, the world record holder and Olympic record held by Mary T. Maher. Her world record time, a 205.96, which as we recall, beat half the men entered in that event as well. <laughs> Let's take a look at our field. Lanes one through seven, one at the top of your screen, Ina Beermann, West Germany, Bistra Gospodinova from Bulgaria, Julie Gorman, USA, Tatania Kornikova from the Soviet Union, Elena Osadchuk and Kelly Davies in five and six, and USA's Jennifer Linder on the bottom of the screen. The race. Tracy Cochran should come from lane four. Lane three and four, John. But actually, the four swimmers in the middle of the pool are all within half a second. Uh, Tashana Kurnikova in lane four is the European record holder in the 100 butterfly. But the 200 butterfly is a difficult event. After 100 yards, 100 meters, your shoulders can get very tired. So it's going to be who can pace the race very well. 
Well, it looks like the Americans, Julie Gorman and Kelly Davies, are staying with the field right now. We did have a last-minute scratch out of lane two. The Bulgarian is not in the field, so there will be an empty lane, you'll notice. First to the wall, it looks like Julie Gorman of the United States. Julie is a very versatile swimmer. She's an individual medalist, too, but she's been consistently swimming very well, and the butterfly is her strongest leg in the individual medley. She likes to needle point in her spare time. The coaches have admired her technique. That's Julie Gorman on the top of the screen. On the bottom in the white cap, Kelly Davies, both Americans. Kelly, of course, 17 years old, out of Ashton, Maryland. She swims with the Curl Swim Club. You'll notice their hips are coming out of the water. They're just being relaxed the first hundred, using their legs, but mainly just trying to keep it long so they can kick hard and keep their momentum going. One minute, 3.36 seconds for our split leader at the 100. That's Kelly Davies of the United States. Kelly Davies and Julie Gorman seeming to control this race at this point. They are. It looks like Julie Gorman is starting to pull away a little bit from Kelly Davies. But it's going to be that last 50 where the piano sometimes seems to fall on your back. And that is where Mary T. Maher has been so strong and has dominated this race. Her absence at the Goodwill Games is giving the Americans an opportunity to shine. That's absolutely right. And get some experience in international competition. Sometimes having someone as great as Mary T. Maher out in front of you can be a little intimidating. And you feel, well, I can't even beat her. But here, these two girls have an opportunity to shine. And they're way out in front. Kelly Davies looking very strong this last 50. It looks like the United States has a chance to sweep this as well. That you see there is Kelly Davies of the USA. Julie Gorman in the top of the screen will be in second. And now it looks like Jennifer Linder from Des Moines, Iowa, in lane seven, coming in for a possible bronze medal. She's a distance swimmer, and she just came home that last 50. And a first place to Kelly Davies. Julie Gorman of the United States will take second, and it looked like a bronze medal. Another one, two, three sweep for the United States. So the American squad does it again. Kelly Davies out of Ashton, Maryland, wins the 200-meter butterfly. Julie Gorman, the young needle pointer out of Towson, Maryland, Swims on the North Baltimore Aquatic Club. She comes in second. And out of nowhere, the final length of the pool, Jennifer Linder, five feet nine inches tall from Des Moines, Iowa, comes in with a third place award. If you were to look at the replay, you'd see these swimmers coming now to the finish. The bottom of the screen, that's Kelly Davies. She's putting her head down and extending to the finish. Puts one last big kick in to help her get into the wall. Looks over, sees Julie Gorman touch at the top of your screen. So the official result in first place, and gold medal for the United States, Kelly Davies, USA, her time 2.12.49. In second place, Julie Gorman, a 2.13.60, and the come from behind bronze medal goes to Jennifer Linder, 2.14.29. Well, the early big stories in the Goodwill Games have been emanating from the swimming venue. Our swimming coverage will end with the events tomorrow. There will be a lot of action to report to you at that time, and we still have more to go to right now. As a matter of fact, I wanted to say one thing before we go back for men's butterfly, and that is that this U.S. team is very young. Some of the women are just mid and late teenagers, and a couple of the men are. For instance, coming up in the next race, uh, the young uh, racer for the Americans, Melbourne Stewart, is only 17 years old. To give you an idea of who might be swimming in the Olympics, maybe the Goodwill Games of 1990, let's go to the swimming venues for the men's 200 butterfly event. Well, the 200-meter butterfly, four lengths of the pool, is viewed by many swimmers as the most painful event on the international swimming program. And I'm sure that tonight will be no exception as this event sees uh, a virtual slugfest between the two superpowers. That's right, John. The top seven in the event are from the United States and the Soviet Union. Melvin Stewart, he's young, he's a talent. He'll be tough, but the only thing is he uh, has been sick the last couple days. We're going to see how that affects him. There's three other Americans in the event. They've got a lot of experience. They'll be good. Uh, it could be our best chance for a USA 1-2-3 sweep. So with a chance of a USA sweep, let's meet the individuals in this 200-meter butterfly. World record by Mikhail Gross of uh, West Germany, 156.24. In lane zero, top of the screen, Mikhail Arctiger from West Germany. Valentin Blasenko from the Soviet Union is in one. The two Americans, Ken Flaherty and Matt Rankin, making up two and three. Alexander Prigoda from the Soviet Union, he's in lane four. Melvin Stewart, the young man that Rowdy talked about, is in lane five. Billy Stapleton in six. Dmitry Prankov from the Soviet Union is in seven. Marek Gizidorczyk from Poland in eight. And Holger Eikhoff from West Germany is in lane nine. 
Well, we talked about the sweep, John, but it's not going to be easy. We can't forget Alexander Pagoda from the Soviet Union. He's in lane four. He's their national champion. He's going to be tough. 22-year-old from Rostov. He swims on the club Dynamo. Holds the Soviet record for the 200 butterfly. Good start. Fair start. Everybody looked like they came, they came off even. Coming to the water late, but coming to the water far, far down the pool. In lane four, Alexander Prigoda from the Soviet Union. He's the man in the black cap. Now, the Americans, have, they, they've had a few days in here, uh, of swimming here. They're going to be ready for this event. There's four guys in there, and they all have a chance to win this thing. Four Americans flanking the top Soviet in lane four. In fact, he's now beginning to drop down a little bit. So the Soviet drops into sixth, seventh place, and the four Americans begin to take the lead. Right now, it's Melvin Stewart, the youngster out of Jamestown, North Carolina, senior at Mercer's Burger Canopy. 17 years old. He's 17 years old. First international trip. This is going to be a great swim. This is basically his only swim. He swam the hunter fly, but didn't do that well in it. He's been sick. He's had the flu. He's thrown up a few times. He's sick, but he's, he feels good today. He felt good in warm-up. Two lengths down, two lengths remaining, and the first man to the wall in lane three. That's Matt Rankin, a 19-year-old out of Portland, Oregon. He'll be a sophomore at the University of Arizona. Known predominantly as an individual meddling specialist, but it looks like the three Americans, Ken Flaherty, Matt Rankin, and Melvin Stewart, are controlling the medals at this point. You got to keep your hips moving up and down here. This third 50 is the main 50 here, especially for the Americans. They've got to keep their hips in it, because once the hips go down, the legs go down, and you start dying, you start dragging your lower body in the water. So not wishing to climb uphill on the way home, it looks like American Ken Flaherty in lane two. Now with a slight edge over the other two Americans, Matt Rankin and Melvin Stewart, and you said, Rowdy Gaines, the possible sweep. Look at Melvin Stewart. He is breathing a little bit different from everybody else. He breathes to the side and not forward to the, as the rest of the swimmers in the race. Why is that? He says that it, it helps his neck. His neck doesn't get as tight. His shoulders don't get as tight. Instead of breathing forward, he just pops his head right over the side just as freestyle. And he's doing a good job right now. It's working for him. Melvin Stewart with the current lead. Possible gold medal right here. Melvin Stewart comes to the wall first. In second place, the United States. In third place, the United States. So just as Rowdy Gaines predicted, a gold, silver, bronze sweep for the United States of America. Melvin Stewart, that man who was not feeling well throughout the week, certainly didn't uh, let down now. A real nice swim for Melvin. I'm sure he's going to feel really happy about that because he has been sick. And we, we, we don't like to dwell on that because and I know he didn't want, want to dwell on that. Matter of fact, we had to find out from one of the coaches that he has been sick. So no excuses, just fast swimming by the youngster from Mercersburg Academy, young Melvin Stewart, an outstanding prospect for the 1988 Olympics in Seoul, Korea. And a gold medal for him on his first international trip all the way in, into Moscow inside the Soviet Union. He swims for that tough school, Mercersburg in the United States. It's a tough swimming school. So while he takes a break, let's review the official results. In first place, Melvin Stewart. Swims for the United States of America, 2.0083. The bronze and silver medals go to Matt Rankin and Ken Flaherty. So with the United States sweeping all the medals, let's go down to poolside and speak with all three of them. Nancy? Melvin, when did you make your big move for this race? Oh, uh, about the 125. The I, just, I looked over and I saw everybody was with me and I said, better get moving. But, uh, about the 125. Did you feel you had a strong from then on I, I felt the pace but um you know you never knew that i saw the russian coming up beside me and i didn't know if he was going to catch me or not because they're they're known to come back fast you know the second half of the race oh, fine race fine race thank you so tell me what tell me about your race well i uh i didn't feel like getting warm up today so i wasn't going to push going out and luckily i felt pretty easy at the 100 so i was able to get home right i mean i would like to have done better but i'm just glad we went one two three Right. Yeah. Listen, were you worried about the Soviets at any point? I sure was. I just, I knew that I should just get out and go for it and just not look back. And I paid for a little bit on the end of the race, but it feels good to go one, two, three. Right. Well, congratulations to all three of you for an American sweep. Thank you. Congratulations, the United States. Those official results. In fact, the United States took the top four okay, places with Billy guys. Stapleton rounding out that field. First place, time two zero zero eighty three. Melvin Stewart in second place the time of 20091 Matt Rankin and Ken Flaherty from Columbus Ohio gets the bronze medal his time 201.06 
part of our Goodwill Games coverage, we're also including the coverage of the Men's World Basketball Championships. It's 24 teams in a round-robin format, first round being played in four different cities in Spain. Uh, in case, by the way, you see the foreign language graphics on the screen of the basketball, and even when we cover events here in Moscow, they are international feeds, and you'll see some Spanish and some Cyrillic and some Russian, and of course the, the color graphics are added by TBS Sports for our coverage of the game. So let's go now to Ferrol, Spain, for the game between the Soviet Union and Israel. You're looking at the Ferrol Sports Center in Ferrol, Spain, an important game tonight in Division B. First round action continues in the Men's World Basketball Championships from Spain. These are two undefeated teams. The USSR beat Cuba 129 to 87 last night and Israel beat Angola 95 to 75. This should be a good matchup. Russia's big front line with Sabonis the seven footer and the two outstanding forwards Volkov and Tikhoninko against uh, the Israel team led by the veteran, the great veteran Mickey Berkowitz and Howie Lassif who played collegiately in the United States at American University. He's had two outstanding games. Mel Proctor along with Atlanta Hawks head coach Mike Fratello again bring you our coverage tonight. What kind of a game can we look for Mike? Mel I think the Israel team is going to play well against them. Uh, obviously they need a big night out of Levon Mercer and Lassoff to uh, compete against the front line of the Russians but uh, you know they've played them well in the past and I think going into the game they're very confident both teams are 2-0 so let's see what happens. The Russians in the red uniforms, Israel in white, and the first attempt by Sabonis. The Russians may have a big edge on the boards with their superior size. This is Kurdinitis, a great outside shooter, going right to the basket to give the Russians a 2 0 lead. Remus Kurdinitis, who scored 20 points last night against Cuba. Israeli team, number nine, Mickey Berkowitz, the outstanding veteran. Number 12 is Doran Yamki, a fine young player. This is Howie Lassif throwing up a wild shot, and he is fouled. Lassif had 25 points in Israel's opening win against Uruguay and 16 last night against Angola. Looks like they're trying to take the ball right at Sabonis, Mel. Maybe they're hopeful that they'll get him in early foul trouble. And uh, after watching him in the last game, I, I think it's a, it's a good idea. He, he wasn't um, real active defensively last night. Berkowitz with the air ball, Levon, Levon Mercer trying to put it in on the follow shot, and he is fouled. He is a very strong player on the boards for the Israeli team, and the foul is on Alexander Volkov, number four of Russia. Russians did a good job of boxing out, but unfortunately, uh, Levon Mercer snuck in around the baseline side and came up with a loose ball. Levon Mercer, who played collegially at the University of Georgia, known in Israel as Levon Bird Cortis. Well, he's an outstanding big man, and... Uh, made a big decision in his career decided that uh, going the European route was best for him rather than try and hang around maybe a second or third year and try and make it in the NBA and he's done extremely well here. Mercer makes one out of two and it's knocked out of bounds the Russians will have possession number 10 is Valdis Walters a 28 year old guard they have a big backcourt Walters and uh, Curtinitis both about six 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 seven. One of the keys we felt all along is the pressure that the defense could put on the Russian guards, and they always see the first turnover, a travel forced by good pressure defense. Number 10, Chaim Lipin, a young playmaking guard for the Israeli team. Mercer working against Sabonis, and a fine steal by Walters. The Russians like to run. And let's see if the basket counts. It does. Fine shot by Walters Walters. And it's 4-1 in favor of the Russians. Berkowitz on the drive. Sabonis tips it right back to Berkowitz, and Sabonis blocks a shot. He can be an intimidating force on defense. Here come the Russians again, and the play is broken up by number 10, Hein Lippin. I'm not sure that was a real good decision by Berkowitz to try and challenge Sabonis uh, under the basket like that. Best thing, maybe back it out and look for a better shot. Walters from way out. Mercer with the rebound for Israel. Can Israel run with a Russian team? Well, I'm sitting here saying to myself, do they want to get into a track meet with the Russian team after the last performance that we witnessed by the Russians? Mickey that, Berkowitz puts it down. That seems to be the Russian strength. Get out in the open floor. They've scored many points now in the first two games, and uh, I'm not so sure Israel doesn't want to slow this thing down. Foul is on number four, Alexander Volkov. The basket is good by Mickey Berkowitz, and he'll also have a free throw. He's an outstanding free throw shooter. 
Played for a couple of years at the University of Nevada, Las Vegas. And we're tied four apiece in the early going from Farol, Israel against Russia. Two undefeated teams. See them picking up Kurdinitis outside. He's got great range, and Sabonis connects for the Russian team. He scored 12 points in each of the first two games for Russia. We'll see Sabonis flash to the high post or top of the circle area many times tonight. They use him from there as a feeder, watching people cutting back door to the basket, or as a scorer, because he's a great jump shooter from there. Doran Yamke on the miss. Sabonis with a rebound, doing a tightrope back to stay inbound. Here come the Russians again, and they turn it over. You know, we mentioned this last night, that sometimes the Russians try to get a little too fancy on the fast break, and as a result, get unnecessary turnovers. Berkowitz is fouled from behind. Valerie Tinkoninko was trying to come in from behind and block the shot, but fouled Mickey Berkowitz. Apparently, they say he blocked the shot out of bounds, and there was no foul. Berkowitz off glass. Mercer can't score on the follow. And a nice steal by Berkowitz, but see if he committed a foul. And again, we are not actually at the arena. We are at our control center in Madrid, Spain. We're unable to hear the officials' words and who the foul is on, but it appears the foul is on Berkowitz on the reach-in. The guards from Israel have been on the glass now and have picked up three offensive rebounds. They know they have a big size disadvantage and try to help out their big men. Kurdinitis on the miss, and Volkov is tied up by Levon Mercer, so we'll have a jump ball. Again, the 30-second shot clock is in effect. The three-point field goal is very much a part of international competition. Kurdinitis, the best three-point shooter for the Russian team. Volkov tips it to Howie Lassif. Looks to me like he stole that tip now on the way up. That's apparently uh, the call. And as you see, if, uh, following a violation, they immediately take the ball out of bounds. The officials don't have to touch the basketball, which is why Lassif just grabbed the ball and stepped out of bounds and inbounded. Sabonis with another rejection. Kurdinaitis finishes off the fast break. Very typical of the Russian fast break. Long outlet pass and... Over here, they run people out, Mel. What I mean by that is when a shot goes up, they release and send the guy along. If they happen to get the rebound, they're there for the home run pass. Tough shot, and it counts. Got a foul on the play. Alexander Volkov committing another foul. On the replay, we see him getting beat along the baseline. There's a defensive rotation, but we get a personal foul. And at the free throw line is number 12, Doran Yamke, a 24-year-old guard, the heir apparent to Mickey Berkowitz and the Israeli team. The Russians lead 8-7. to seven. First half action, third game of the tournament for each team. Once again, we see when the pressure defense picks up the ball, the Russians have problems with that. Sabonis on the miss, but he got fouled by Howie Lassif. Lassif, a 6'11", 240-pounder. We see Sabonis run a little back door here. Tonight, Sabonis seems more active, Mel. He's more involved in the game than he was last night. Just thinking the same thing. He seemed to kind of go through the motions in the first two games, playing about as hard as he had to, but tonight he realizes they're facing a tough opponent in Israel, and he seems mentally ready for this game. He, he had designated himself as the passer last night, the feeder, and was going to take a shot only as a last resort. Tonight, he's come out early and tried to assert himself. Arvidas Sabonis, a first-round draft pick of the Portland Trailblazers. He was drafted by the Atlanta Hawks on the fourth round last year. Russia leading 10-7. Mercer with the air ball, and here come the Russians on the break again. Sabonis really runs for a man 7-2. Kurdinaitis trying to tip it in. And Lassif clears it out to Mickey Berkowitz. Berkowitz thought he got fouled. Here comes Kurdinaitis leading a three-on-two break. Kurdinaitis on the tip, but it won't drop. You notice that it, the Israel team, they're fighting for their lives on the glass. The Russians just keep playing volleyball with it off the glass, Mel, and uh, they're going to have to get all their people back to help out on the boards. Russia leads Israel 10-7 in the first half from Farol, the Farol Sports Center, which holds 6,800. Because of the three block shots already, they've intimidated the Israeli team. And there's our score with 15-31 remaining in the first half. The Russians leading by three.
Michael Proctor with Mike Fratello, the head coach of the Atlanta Hawks, bringing you tonight's matchup as Arvita Sabonis scores on a sweeping hook shot for the Russians. He is off to a great start tonight, and the Russians lead 12-7. Well, we can see the game plan, Mel. They're going inside the Sabonis, and they're going to make the Israeli team have to stop them before they back it off. The Israeli team simply doesn't have the size to match up well with the three seven-footers on the Russian team. Mercer over Sabonis, and goaltending is called. Well, I like that by LeVon Mercer. He has to take the ball at Sabonis, make Sabonis move his feet defensively, force him to react. Russia leading by three. Valdis Walters into Curtinitis, guarded by Berkowitz. Curtinitis having difficulty getting off his outside shot tonight. He finally shakes free, and he was fouled by Berkowitz. That's a bad foul, Mel. Whenever a jump shooter goes up, you don't want to give him unnecessary free throws. You go up, you challenge the shot, but you want to avoid body contact. Here, it's a late foul. After the man's released the ball, we're putting him on the line, or taking the ball out, rather, for no necessary reason. Walters on the drive, and he is fouled. The Israeli team piling up the fouls, and when you reach eight team fouls, then a team enters the penalty situation. Foul is on Hein Lippen of Israel. The Russians scoring another basket to go up 14-9. Israel with a very young backcourt. Hein Lippin and Adi Gordon, two youngsters, alternate as the point guard. Walters on the pull-up. A three-pointer for Valdis Walters. Different mentality over here as you come down on the fast break. We look for layups. They look for three-point shots many times. And it's 17-9 to in favor of the USSR. See what happens, Mel, if you don't go at Sabonis. He just controls the whole lane. Stands there, backs off his man, blocks shots, or grabs rebounds to start their fast break. Basket is scored by Doran Yankee, although it appeared that Sabonis actually tipped it in, and it's 17 to 11 in favor of the Russians. They won this tournament in 1982 in Cali, Colombia, defeating the American team. Sabonis on the scoop. He's so agile for a man, seven foot two. He, he's denied at the high post, reverses, and gets a backdoor layup. Yankee with a baseline jumper over Sabonis, and there is a foul. Uh, number nine, Valerie Tinkoninko of USSR. Tinkoninko, a seventh-round draft pick of the Atlanta Hawks. Let's watch this. To get this shot up and over both of these players, that's a tough shot right there going to the baseline. Doran Yankee at the free-throw line. 25 years old, 6 feet 5 inches tall. The USSR with a six-point lead, 19-13. First half action from Farol in the 10th World's Championship. 24 countries competing this year, the largest field ever. Tinko Ninko with a nice fake and a baseline pull-up. Pretty move. Well, that's a good move right there. That's a big-time move, Matt. Um, we saw that time they used Sabonis as the feeder. He watched him come off the double screen and skip the ball across the floor. The Russians open up a nine-point lead. Lasif pressured, throws up a wild shot. And at the other end, Tinkoninko scores for the Russians. That's what we're talking about, Mel, the long pass, people running out to get the easy score at the other end. They have to cover the backcourt a little bit better, but the Israeli guards are forgetting about the people running out. The USSR with an 11-point lead. Mercer guarded by Sabonis. Yamke's jumper is short. Tinkoninko on the breakaway for the stop. Once again, the jump shooter never covered the backcourt, Mel, and they had an imbalance in their offensive set. No floor balance, as we call it. And the Russians are beginning to pull away an impressive first-half performance so far by the USSR as they have doubled the score on Israel, 26-13. People from all over the world are in Moscow this week and next week to attend and watch the Goodwill Games. Celebrities alike abound around Moscow. And Leroy Neiman, an artist everyone I'm sure is aware of, particularly because of his sports paintings as they would relate to the Goodwill Game and international track and field and other sporting events, is with us. Leroy Neiman, one of the judges for the Samantha Smith poster contest that was held by the Turner Broadcasting System. He's been kind enough to join us in our studios here at Ostankano Television Broadcast Center on the north side of Moscow, and he's with Marianne Laughlin right now. 
Thanks, Bob. We are happy that uh, Leroy Neiman was kind enough to get up at this very early hour, Moscow time. Mm -hmm. And as Bob said, uh, you're going to be showing us your impressions of the city of Moscow and of the sporting events going on here as part of the Goodwill Games. What have you seen so far that has struck you? Struck you? This certainly is a picturesque city. Uh, I was in New York to, for uh, the 4th of July for the great ceremonies of Statue of Liberty. You and flew think over of, fast. Come, <laughs> and I, while I was packing, I watched the opening day ceremonies here, which was very impressive. But then to come in here and the marked contrast between New York and Moscow is just astounding. But then we went out, my producer, Ken Zarin, we're working together on this thing. Mm -hmm. we, we absolutely scouted this whole city. We've been on the road for two days mm -hmm. checking everything out. And it's really impressive, the similarities between, say, New York and Moscow. Such the as? Heavy traffic and it's the sociological problems that arise because this is a city that's, that's coming up with this, facing the different new problems that culture has to offer. Mm -hmm. What do you but think the, of the, uh, the Byzantine uh, architecture? I that's something the, to see, The cathedrals it? and the Kremlin, the icons and everything, these minarets. I'm sketching all that stuff. Can you show us some, some of what idea. you've done already? Here is the... Here's my red, my red square, a watercolor I did out there the other day. Uh-huh. And I've got one here of, uh, these are the minarets at the St. Basil's Cathedral. That's what it really looks I'm like. I'm working there all the time now because I'm doing a large 8 by 10 or 10 by 12 foot oil painting on canvas. And we're going to take it right out into red square and paint it. I'm working on it now in a studio. I've got a, I've got a studio called the Sertikov Art School. It's the official... Uh, Soviet art school, the greatest art school in in Russia, where I have my studio. What an I'm opportunity! I'm painting right there. Oh, that's marvelous! Great environment. I want to talk more with you about the Samantha Smith operation that you've been involved with in the poster contest, mm -hmm. and we're going to be taking a look, of course, throughout the games uh, at Leroy Neiman's work, and we're going to be looking at some of the winners from that art competition coming up. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Neiman, who, as we said earlier, was one of the judges, uh, along with um, Jim Davis and Jamie Wymouth, uh, of a poster contest, a very unusual poster contest, sponsored by the Samantha Smith Foundation and Turner Broadcasting. And uh, would you explain very briefly, uh, Leroy, exactly how this came about and what, we, what was involved? Well, I just, we had the judging at the Waldorf, and we brought in all the finalists from around the country. And these were children who painted yes. posters of their ideas of world yeah. peace? very remarkable results that they got. Mm -hmm. and the, the one of the winners has kind of a Richard Linder kind of quality to his drawing, which I liked a great deal. I remember it distinctly. That and he's the young, fun young artist is here that. right now. So. Oh, terrific. Let's take a look at the, the two national winners. This is called Graduation, and this is by Veo Metalli from the Royal Elementary School in Honolulu, Hawaii, 11 years old. And as we said, there were, there were two winners uh, nationally, and then there were um, one, there was one winner from every other state as, as a runner-up. That's a super one. And winner. this is the one you were talking about before. This, this is, is called here. Together in Goodwill. Uh, Rusty Thrower of Bedford Junior High School in Hearst, Texas, a 14-year-old. Tell us about this one. Well, he's, this is a Soviet uh, soldier and an American sitting side by side in this theater. And there's a very mysterious figure lurking in a doorway there. I don't know what that's supposed to symbolize, but it gives it a little mystical quality. It's a lovely piece of work for a 14-year-old. Yeah, that's a, he's got a lot of promise, oh, great rendering terrific. ability there, yes. Terrific. It was, it was a great uh, opportunity for all of these people um, from all over the United States and elsewhere outside of our country uh, mm -hmm. to come up together with, with their concepts of what peace is all about, and I'm glad you could be with us today. And think of the young people being here to, to be on the spot in Moscow. It's marvelous. The winners, oh, yes. of course, got to come to Moscow, mm -hmm. and uh, we're going to be taking a look at more of their work as it is on display here in Moscow, all the winners from around the world. Um, so tourists and uh, visitors here to the city can uh, take a look at all of the winners. And we're going to be taking a look at your work throughout the games. We're going to be seeing uh, um, all I'm kinds of... I'm going to be all over town. I promise you that. I'll okay. be all over. That's Terrific. right. And I'm going to start out at the velodrome tonight. Okay. I'm going straight over there. J just enough time, I think. Yes. <laughs> Thanks very much for joining us, Thank Leroy. You. Let's go back to Bob Neal. Okay, I wanted to ask Leroy if he's around town. You'll probably see Paul Horning, who's here to cover the boxing. 
Maybe you could do a sketch of Paul, although he's in motion, constant motion around Moscow. <laughs> I did Paul in the old days. <laughs> in the old days. <laughs> right, we may show days. some of those pictures, too. Leroy <laughs> Neiman, we appreciate him being here in our studios with us tonight. Nice. I've tried to describe the shapes and the colors of the Byzantine architecture and the cathedrals in Moscow to so many friends, and until just a moment ago, I didn't know how to do it. And one way is to show you a Leroy Neiman sketch. What beautiful works of art. We'll be back to continue with the Soviet Union versus Israel in men's basketball from Feral Spain right after this. Stay with us. We'll return with more. Return to Feral Spain for continuation of the basketball game between the Soviet Union and Israel. I might just point out something I've noticed. You may have too, particularly if you're a big as basketball fan as I am. And that is the change of style and play over the last few years of international competitors. The Soviet Union was always good, but they used to be big and lumbering and machine-like. Now much more smooth, behind the back dribbles, behind the back passes. They are a force to be reckoned with. Just watch. We're going back to Feral Spain. The Russians have clearly been the class of the World Basketball Championship so far, winning their first two games by 38 and 42 points and leading 112 to 75 against the Israeli team with a minute left in the game. And Mike Fratello, does there appear to be any team in this tournament that can challenge the powerful Russian entry? Well, whether it be Spain, the United States, Italy, Canada, Yugoslavia, whoever it is, if they're going to challenge this team, they better have a complete repertoire to go against the Russians. This is a complete deep team. They have scorers, rebounders, shop blockers. They run the fast break well. Tonight they came and shifted gears and showed us their best play. Sergei Karakhanov scoring for the Russians. The, all of the starters are on the bench now. The stars, Alexander Volkov and Arvidas Sabonis and Valery Tinkoninko, the big guns for the Russians, getting a rest, getting ready for the next game. And you're looking at the biggest of the three seven-footers, Vladimir Kachenko at 7'3 three and 300 pounds. The Israeli team had no big people inside to compete with Sabonis this evening. From the beginning, Sabonis was going to dominate the game. Levon Mercer, Howie Lassoff had no chance against him. He has too much size, too much strength, completely dominated the paint area. Ari Rosenberg, one of the young Israeli players at the line. This looks like a club that will be pretty good in time with young players like Rosenberg and Ari Gordon and uh, some of the others, Hein Lippen, another fine point guard at the age of 20. Their future clearly ahead of them, but it has been all Russia tonight. They need big people. They have good young guards, uh, small people. Now they have to get some size up front to compete against other teams like the Russians. The Russians have already won three world championships, trying to make it four. They captured the title in 1982 at Cali, Colombia, beating the Americans in the championship game, and they are clearly an outstanding team again. Their head coach, Vladimir Obukov, has to be pleased with the way his team has performed in all three games so far. And so that does it as the Russians have defeated Israel by a score of 114 to 77 tonight in Ferrol. Now we want to go back to Linden Stadium for more track and field action. One of the glamour events of track and field is the men's 400 meter. Antonio McKay from the United States, who was a star on the rise at a disappointing Olympics. But he's here in Moscow hoping to do a little bit better. Let's go to Linden Stadium and Charlie Neal. This is the men's 400 meters in progress right now. You, what you're watching happened moments ago. Dr. Leroy Walker's with me. The young man you're looking at is Danny Everett of the United States. He's in the first section. We'd say the first section. They're calling it heats, as you see there. There are too many participants to put them all in one field, so they've divided it into three sections. We'll call it sections. They're calling it heats. This is heat number two. Antonio McKay is the young man you're looking at. He's in lane number two, and he is a favorite. Yeah, Antonio knows that in this race, with the opposition he has, he has to set it up himself. Normally, he likes to go out slow and reel people in at the, at the very end. He can't do it with this race. And you can see that his movement is what it should be, Charlie. And Korchiakin of the Soviet Union making his move, as is the young man, Chernesko. But there goes McKay on the inside. And Antonio has already cut the stagger down, so he's in great shape. Now, if he runs this third 100, which is the key to this race, and he's doing it well, spilling into that straightaway, which he has to do to have momentum for the straight. The world point. record is 43.86, held by Lee Evans of the United States. He set that back in 1968. And coming down the stretch, it's going to be Tony McKay all the way. It's going to be the United States. This is the second heat of the men's 400 meters. 44.98 is good time. Antonio ran a very smart race. He normally waits. This time he did not. He set it up well. He went by the 200 and by 21.7. And that's what it took for him to be able to come in 
in the time that he did. What is technique in the 400 meters for men? Well, it's a, it's a race where stride frequency and stride length are all important. And you can see here that Antonio has good arm movement and good leg movement. His stride length remains the same. His frequency is about the same, although there was some deceleration, and he went through the finish line well. 1984 bronze medalist at the Olympic Games, Antonio McKay from Atlanta, Georgia. We have a Goodwill profile on him. I think it's a challenge to play games, you know, it's, a, it's just like track, it's not a game, it's more serious, but when you play these games, you got to have the attitude that you want to win for it and carry over into your running. It's just like when I'm playing the uh, wrestling against the USA. I always want to be the USA, and, uh, and I always want to win, and if I lose, I want to play again. The time the game is over, and I like to go to game rooms and play games, but Games motivate me. It's just like in life, I, I play a lot of games with myself. I challenge myself to do things that people have never done before. And that's what it's all about, I think. The biggest challenge for me now to go fast in 4386 that was set by Lee Evans in Mexico. And uh, that's just one of the biggest challenges. I think if I do that, it's going to take a lot to get me started again because that is one of the biggest milestones in track and field along with the long jump that Bob Bean and set. When I left high school, I hated training, but I'm starting to enjoy it a little more than I used to. I'm really starting to mix everything up with a rope, is bike ride, and long distance and sprint work. I used to just do sprint work, so I'm really starting to get into it. To be the best I can possibly be, where Coach Folks convinced me that I had to train every day. I think Coach Folks is the tough father type coach. He's the, the coach that demands the most from you. But um, if you give it all you got, you know, he's the best coach you can possibly deal with because you have a relationship with him. He's just an outstanding young man. He possesses a tremendous amount of character and a tremendous desire to win. Uh, I really don't think he has any great weaknesses. He's physically very strong uh, as far as weightlifting and his body strength. He's got a tremendous amount of speed for a quarter miler. He could be a short sprinter if he elected to be. UCLA, Henry Thomas. McKay had a little bit of a slip on that. Well, I think watching yourself on the tape, you learn a lot from races. You run it. One lap to go. McKay is dead last at this point. So McKay has the strength to come back if he gets out. Well, he's swinging wide now, which is a smart thing to do. Get out of trouble so you can get free to run. And here is Roddy Haley in first place. But on comes Antonio McKay on the outside to win the race, Antonio McKay. When I tried to accelerate, I felt like I had a chance to win the race right here. So I really started to pump my arms. And the race was over right here. I really knew it was over. And uh, that's why I started to celebrate there. Well, when I finish running track, I really want to go into business management, which that's my major at Georgia Tech. I want to go into business working with a family, some kind of business that's going to be connected to a family that I think is worthwhile to me because that's what I do right now. I love going around speaking to different kids, and I really enjoy that. And then I want to do some coaching on the mental part about coaching and probably have two coaches. I think that would be one of my greatest assets to coach and uh, to deal with the mind. We just got to look at Antonio McKay. Remember, his time is 44.98, so that's the mark that they're going to be shooting for in this third section of the men's 400 meters. And heavy hitters like Daniel and uh, Robinson are in this. Do you think they can do it? Well, you know, uh, Mc they have the advantage in knowing what McKay's time was. They know what to shoot at, but McKay is in the clubhouse, and they're going to have to go at this. They have the disadvantage of Tiago being out of this race, which usually is the kind of person that would set it up for them and go out, but the burden is on them, and they've got to set it up themselves. United States has three runners in this race. Clarence Daniel in lane number one. Darrell Robinson is in lane number three. And in lane number five is Walter McCoy. Remember, Darrell Robinson, kind of an eccentric type of runner, isn't he? Yeah, and Charlie, they got to be in trouble here now because the Soviet Union runners and all are out in front of them. But Robinson and McCoy now begin to move in this third 100, which is the key to this race. As you see, Darrell Robinson, lane number two. But watch Clarence Daniel, lane number one. He's starting to make his move as they come down the final stretch. And it's Clarence Daniel trying to take the lead away from Darrell Robinson, and he just does. This is very strange because in spite of his eccentricities, Robinson is usually a great finisher. 
and he didn't have it that time. Clarence Daniel comes in first, followed by Darrell Robinson. Walter McCoy was a 1-2-3 finish of the United States, 45-1-3, the unofficial time. Now, this is the point of time when Robinson is usually getting away from you, but you can see here he's struggling a little bit, although his form is pretty good. Daniel on the inside is running well. He has good leg action, his pump is good, his head is steady, and he's going to make it at the lean, driving straight through. But 45-13 is not enough. Not enough to beat Antonio McKay, who in the second heat, call it, we call it the second section, ran a 44-98. Again, you're looking at the third heat. It was Clarence Daniel and Darrell Robinson. The official winners now, McKay with a 44-98, Daniel 45-11, Robinson is third, a United States sweep with a 45-15. And there you saw it, another sweep for the USA in the 400-meter men's competition. Coming up next, as our coverage of the Goodwill Games continues, we'll have volleyball for you. Stay tuned. Volleyball competition is underway at Lennon Stadium Small Arena. Just a note on women's volleyball. There are two groups, A and B. It is round-robin competition. The favorites going into this were generally considered to be the Soviet Union, Japan, possibly the United States. The USA was upset earlier today. If you saw the Eastern Time Zone afternoon report of our Goodwill Games coverage, you saw North Korea beat the United States. Soviet Union is now in action. And let's go out to the small arena with Leandra Riley. In this match between West Germany and the Soviet Union, West Germany in white, the Soviet Union in red and blue. And Ann Myers, it's really been the Soviet Union all the way so far in this match. Well, we kind of knew that they would dominate the West Germans. They won the first game 15-8, and the second game 15-1 to in Krivo Shieva, number 12 for the Soviet Union, who's their setter. And there's number 10, Volter, Constance Volter for the West Germans. But... Krivo Shieva has really dominated in the second game. She served 10 straight points. That becomes so very important. If you can't get it over the net, you don't get a, a point in volleyball. You get a side out. Uh, so it's very important that you serve well to get the points. It's not like tennis. Points only awarded on the service. So we are in our third and possibly final game if the Soviet Union wins this one. They win the match against the Federal Republic of Germany. And that has been the strength right there for the Soviet Union, is their blocking. Oh. And that one went off the block, so the Soviet Union gets their first point, and it is one to nothing. Back with the servant is Svetlana Safranova. As we look at the West German squad is requesting a floor wipe in women's volleyball, and men's volleyball for that matter, when you dive on the floor, uh, there's some problems with sweat and the players don't like to fall so they ask for a floor wipe when it gets to be a real long match and a team will try to break up the uh the play of the other team and the momentum and they get it the floor try to be wiped up there's a replay on the block right there by the soviets but they just couldn't get down to get the ball so trailing by one point west germany gets the service nice fake and going right through it all is safranova Safranova is another player that's been real strong in the first two games. She has really put down a lot of kills and it has even had a lot of single blocks. Julia Salachevich, she has not seen much action in the first two games. Nice serve. Ace. Two serving zero. Oh, beautiful serve. Good cover right there. Nice back set to Dink. Still alive. Into the Soviet block, but it goes out of bounds. A break for the West Germans. It's a good block by the Soviets, but they've got their hands turned to the outside, and the West Germans just watch it go out of bounds. Constance Volter serving. All the way over to Kachalova. Good up. Free ball going to the Soviet Union. Let's see what they do with it. Time they go with a short hit. Didn't work. The dink. It's covered. Back set and the dink works for Safranova. 
That was one of the longest rallies that they've had in all three games. And Safranova, the way she goes up for the ball, she reaches just with one hand, and the left hand stays down, and you don't know which way she's going to go. Another nice serve by Ogienko. It is now three serving zero. 15 points is a game, three games wins the match, and the Soviet Union is ahead two games to none. The West Germans have had a lot of trouble passing the ball. There they had their block up and they had time to maybe get a chance to dig the ball. Here the West Ger or I'm sorry, the Soviets are going up. Nice dink right there. Mm. And Vita was able to get a hand on it and just roll down. Nice dig. And they save it. Free ball for West Germany. Oh, what a beautiful block by the Soviet Union. It was a good cross play by the West Germans, but the Soviets were right there. Katalova really put the ball away. You could see her number nine on the, in the red and blue at the bottom of your screen. And the West Germans have called the timeout because they trail by a score of five to nothing. We'll rejoin the volleyball game shortly, but right after this, we're going to be back into our studio with special guest, swimming commentator John Neighbor will be here with Soviet swimming great Vladimir Solnikov. Stay with us. Soviet swimming star Vladimir Solnikov set his, broke his own world record in the 800 meter, won a gold meter, a medal in the 1500 meter, then was upset today in the 400 meter by a young American swimmer. But he's a classy man, and he's kind enough to join us in the studio, and he's with John Neighbor. With me right now is probably the most famous name in international swimming. He's a world record holder many times over. In fact, he broke a world record here at the Goodwill Games, Vladimir Salnikov and his lovely wife, Marina. Vladimir, you've broken world records many times. What were you thinking when you broke the world record here at the Goodwill Games? I was real, real happy because uh, I do it uh, since the first time since uh, 1983. The last uh, world record was broken in Los Angeles in uh, Olympic pool. And it, it was the first uh, record in Olympic pool in Los Angeles. <laughs> was your wife ever thrown in the water before? <laughs> no, it, 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 it's the first bathing in the swimming pool. That's good. What about the, uh, the recent 400 meters freestyle? It was an upset for you. What do you think about that? Um, yes, I start to swim uh, that race uh, maybe uh, without usual feeling of the water. And uh, I put too much strings and maybe I'm not pulling myself toward, but just cut the water. Mm -hmm. And so uh, that's why the time is uh, slower than I expected before. It was also done immediately after the 1500 meter freestyle. Uh, yes, but I think uh, I didn't uh, um, swim too hard 1500 freestyle. I think uh, it's only feeling, I lost the feeling of the water. Mm -hmm. Now, you swam against a, a team of American swimmers, many names you've never met before. What did you think of the American team? Uh, I heard it, it was a second team um, of swimmers. So I can say they uh, compete very hard on each event and they be successful in a lot of events. So we, uh, we are very glad to, uh, to compete with a so strong team. And uh, I think uh, some, of the, some of the American swimmers show their best results. And also we are glad because it's happened in the Olympic pool. This is true. The Goodwill Games, the first time they've ever been held, they are held in your hometown. What do you think about the Goodwill Games? I think it's, it was a good idea to organize uh, Goodwill Games because we uh, became to understand each other more, uh, more better. Mm -hmm. And also, it's uh, one more chance to, to meet with uh, all people, all athletes all the world during the Olympic season. So I, be, I think it will be a good tradition. Vladimir, you are 26 years old. In 1990, the next Goodwill Games, you will be 30 years old. Will you still be swimming? Oh, I don't know yet. <laughs> so if I feel uh, I have enough uh, strength, I uh, will continue swimming. Well, congratulations on a very impressive career. Uh, thanks, you. 
Okay, when I say we are live in Moscow, I mean we are live in Moscow. It's time to play our Goodwill Games trivia. Now, I'll explain what I mean by being live in a moment. There's the Soviet, the Cyrillic writing for the word tonight, and I'm going to try to pronounce that. <laughs> Wish me a lot of luck. Bolshoya Shiska, I think, is what that says. Yes, I, I, I understand that I'm close. Bolshoya Shiska is tonight's Soviet word. It's a phrase, actually, and it means, I guess you knew that, big pine cone, as in our producer, Ken Fouts. He is our big pine cone here. You might know it in the States as big cheese. So now you know, boy, Shoya Shiska. <laughs> That's the best one yet. I'm, I'm... Shoya Shiska. Shiska. Yes, or, yes, sir. Or big pine the cone. Emphasis on the sir. <laughs> We're going to take you back to women's volleyball now. Stay with us. Our coverage continues. Russia and East Germany. We'll show you she's... Seven serving zero. Soviet Union against the Federal Republic of Germany. The Soviet Union is on top. They are in red and blue in this third game of a match between these two countries. The Soviet Union won the first two games. This is our third game, possibly our final game, as our score climbs to 8-0. Good, strong outside hit by Salsevich. Back to action. And that's crossed over the line. It'll be a side out Mention for West Germany. Germany. Julia Salsovich just kind of stuck her arm out there and said, oh, no, let me bring it back. Yeah, you're not allowed to do that in volleyball. Once it crosses the plane of the net, you can't bring it back. Oh, they couldn't see it. Sometimes when it comes off the block, you just lose it, and that's what happened there. Kundalova just hit the ball so hard, and the West Germans knew that they had the block, and then they thought they were through. This is Kundalova with the serve. Good quick set for the West Germans. They made it work. Sigurd Tersteg saw that Kundaleva came up too high after the service, as you can see here, and she was caught that's too right. far forward. They had one back and couldn't recover. Good dump by Krivo Shieva. Krivo Shieva, what is so good about her is she has so much experience, but yet she has only played one year internationally. 85 was her first experience on the national team, even though she's 26 years old. She has a lot of experience at that setting position. A couple substitutions for the Soviet Union. Garbatschuk has come into the game, as has Bueller for the Federal Republic of Germany. Beautiful hit by Agienko. Well, it was a real good pass by the Soviets. When they can pass like that, they've got the opportunity to run the kind of plays that they want to, and there was no block up on that one. B.T. Bueller trying to get across court, but it went out of bounds. So we look at our first referee, D. Onodera. Ten serving zero. And again, it's a cross-court hit that's doing it. Gorbachev, who came in off the bench, has found the spot. And a look. what's creating this for the Soviets, enabling them to get kills like this, is Krivo Shieva off her serve. She's scored two, three points right in a row not right now, and the West Germans are having a very difficult time trying to control her serve. As we mentioned in the second game, she had scored 10 straight points just off her serve. Svetlana Safranova. And there she no, serves it out. <laughs> yeah. It happens. We talk about her serving and then she does it. Nice fake by the Soviet Union, and it catches the West Germans a little off balance, side out, 11 serving zero. The Soviets really controlling the tempo of the game. They're getting some good Union passes so and able to run their outside game, the middle, some crosses. They really have their choice on what they want to do. Nice block by the Soviet Union. Well, it just shows you right there how tall they are and how strong they are at the net. They look like they hardly even jumped. 12 to nothing. In case you can't read the Cyrillic alphabet, that's our scoreboard here in Moscow. 
Замена в команде СССР. At just about do or die time for the Federal Republic of Germany, they trail by 12 points at this junction. They're going to have to get on the scoreboard. Side out. Bogienko serving for the Soviet Union. She's number one. Nice serve. Pretty. Oh. That ball died within that 10-foot line, and the West Germans just couldn't get a hold of themselves to move their feet. And Kundaleva was licking her chops when she saw that coming back. She said, here's They're dinner. Give me more. Mm -hmm. 13 serving zero. Gudrun Witt providing the honors for the Federal Republic of Germany. And again, when the West Germans can get a good pass, they can run some options off their plays and get a playoff, and they got a good kill. Kachalova is another one for the Soviets that has been very strong at the net. I don't think we've really seen anyone weak at the net for the Soviet <laughs> Union. And as this competition continues, that could prove trouble for the United States because these two teams could meet for the championship if they both survive their pools. That's right. The strongest teams in each pools are the Soviet Union and Peru, and then in the other pool, the United States and Japan. Nice off-speed hit. That really was by Krivo Shieva, again at the net. She's dumped the ball over a couple times, and she really controls that front row. And we saw 16 and 6 exchange places. So Salcevich and Nikolaeva are rotated again for their positions. In volleyball, you must substitute for the same person. The chance is going for anyone. And a starter can only come back in once. So if she comes out, if she starts a game, she comes out, then she can go back in that one time. Nice serve. A little confusion among the uh, West German front line. Nice hit on the south paw of Salcevich, number six. A lot of times that lefty will throw you off. Salcevich coming down right down the line, and West German is not able to recover. And that service went out of bounds, so it'll be side out in favor of the Federal Republic of Germany. The Soviets in this third game have had three or four service errors. Pretty, pretty play. The flying Agienko came sailing in for that one. Side out, Soviet Union. Watch her fly all the way across. Uh, not much the West Germans can do by the time the block gets up. And the kill is already down. Germans are a scrappy team. They, they're not as talented, obviously, but they really hustle. Again, that front line, Ogienko. 13 serving zero. Mm, what a serve. She's got that spin serve that comes right down. Out of top spin, 14-0. This could be game and match point. So by really not able to get up off the ground to get the ball over the net. See the West Germans calling a play, holding their fingers behind their back. And that winds things up for this match. 15 to 0. Nope, they're going to give them a side out. They said it went off the block. So the West Germans, with their backs against the wall, can try to get on the scoreboard. Zero serving 15. They got lucky on that one, huh? There's a little bit of protest, but they said, no, it, you touched it before it went out of bounds. So the Soviets lost the ball. The tangle at the net. Still alive, going all the way across court with the dink. And Germany's not there. Side out. Good dink by Gorbachev up at the net that the West Germans were kind of out of place, 
double block right there, and they can't get back to recover. Game and match point at stake here. Ah. And it took an unfortunate bounce for the Federal Republic of Germany, and they are shut out in this third game, 15 to 0. And there are the Soviets, obviously used to winning. <laughs> Well, the Soviet Union starting to show some dominance in the women's volleyball. The United States was upset today by North Korea. Most people thought that the Soviet Union, Japan, and the United States would be the toughest. Now, because the United States lost today did not knock them out of the volleyball round-robin tournament, but it does mean that tomorrow's game with Japan, which we'll be carrying here, is a win-or-else situation for the USA women's volleyball team. That will be an excellent volleyball game. Stay with us. We'll continue with our coverage of the Goodwill Games. Well, Marianne, if we were to recap today's activities, there were some tremendous victories by U.S. athletes and athletes from other countries, too. If you had to think of one that was most memorable, what would it be? Well, I think especially uh, speaking as an American, I think you had to pick out Jackie Joyner finally breaking that 7,000-point mark and winning her first gold here at the Goodwill Games and also setting a long jump record for uh, the heptathlon. Uh, she was just outstanding today. It was uh, just one of many great performances. Jackie Joyner with a world record in the heptathlon today. I'd say would, I would vote with you on that as being the most exciting in a day of a lot of exciting events. I want to remind you, we're going to be back shortly uh, to continue our coverage of the Goodwill Games. Kurt Gowdy, who's been in Moscow for a few days covering the marathon, and he'll be covering other events too, has been all around town. He's been all over the world covering sports for many years, and his observations will be very interesting. We'll also cover the decathlon. We'll take a look at the undefeated Soviet women's basketball team and also wrap up today's activities in track and field. A whole lot more to come. We hope you'll join us in a moment as we continue with our coverage of the Goodwill Games.